good afternoon everyone uh, now we are delighted to welcome you all to ICGB DBT international workshop on synthetic biology of photosynthetic organisms to produce value added products that is uh, synbio 2022 for short now uh, this is uh, the last workshop in, in the series of uh, workshops supported by DBT in collaboration with ICGB now this is a uh, the, this week-long workshop will aim uh, to uh, have uh, different talks from all the eminent uh, scientists in the field and uh, these will uh, cover topics on genome editing, transcriptional silencing, uh, modulation of biosynthetic pathways, metabolic transport and storage and other emerging technologies related to value-added products and also carbon capture to mitigate uh, carbon footprinting. This workshop will uh, open the platform for knowledge sharing with uh, sessions that are structured for synthetic biology enabled engineering technologies from an industry perspective. I uh, will now request our uh, director ICGB, Dr. Dinagar Saloke, to please grace this occasion with his presence and deliver the inaugural address. Sir. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, it is. I'm not going to uh, give an inaugural address because I'm not competent uh, to give an address in this field. But I will give a brief welcome to all the participants and the distinguished speakers uh, who have actually taken time out to be here and tell a little bit about. ICGB as an institution and this series of uh, workshops. Uh, the, this is not the last in the series of these workshops. This is only the sixth in the series. We will have another six workshops uh, subsequently because uh, very soon to be finished within next six months or so. So. Uh, these are a set of 12 wet workshops that we planned uh, originally to be held in 2020-21, but uh, pandemic uh, couldn't allow us to do that. We didn't want to do these workshops uh, online because they were meant to be hands-on workshops and so we it luckily things have much improved during this year and we began uh, arranging these workshops. So <coughs> ICDB has a long history of providing hands-on training to uh, students, junior faculty, postdoctoral fellows to come and work in the areas in which we have expertise but also in the areas peripheral to our interest where we can get uh, scientists invited to demonstrate uh, new techniques uh, and in that sense about uh, uh, three to five thousand uh, students have undergone training in last several years but <coughs> at some stage uh, <coughs> our uh, host country funding, they thought what we are doing is minuscule compared to what is the requirement in terms of uh, advanced uh, uh, biotechnology activities that are going on. So just providing training in a year, uh, three or four times in uh, areas as we were covering earlier, using ICGB's fund specially for this purpose is not um, going to cover much of the uh, developing world particularly member countries interest or even within India. So they actually thought giving special funds for us to enhance our ability to conduct these workshops and we decided to do as a starting point, at least six workshops in a year, uh, which meant every two months a workshop. And uh, we took up this uh, to be done in two years, but uh, as I said, pandemic.
pandemic uh, sort of uh, affected our plans. So since we got some relief in last uh, three months or so, we began organizing this and at this go at least we decided to do it uh, in a much faster way and that is how these six uh, workshops were uh, planned and organized very successfully, almost back to back. Uh, another uh, workshop in bioenergy area was just finished yesterday. So in, it is truly and in the same overlapping uh, location. So it has been quite hectic and my colleagues have been wonderful in being able to cope up with this. Not only uh, my group leaders but also uh, students in the labs have been most uh, active and quite excited about doing this. So very soon we will come up with a schedule for another six workshops in addition to the four workshops that we would have otherwise conducted. So it is it almost like a continuous ongoing process and which only covers one of the mandates of uh, ICGB that is to provide advanced training in contemporary areas of biotechnology for the participants within India and uh, from the member countries. And the other uh, activities that we are engaged with are uh, um, fundamental and translational research in um, human health as well as agriculture. And more recently, uh, the topic which uh, this workshop is part of is bioenergy. And my colleagues have been doing extraordinarily well in those areas. We have uh, quite a few foreign students working in the labs, either PhD or postdoctoral colleagues, as well as a large number of Indian students. And our labs uh, have been contributing both in translational way, in terms of vaccines, diagnostics, and in fundamental research with mechanistic studies in variety of areas. So we have been active and uh, I, recommend all the participants, including uh, the invited speakers, to interact with many more colleagues outside uh, bioenergy and get a feel of what ICGB uh, is. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you can also explore uh, uh, the entire campus. The temperatures have come down, so the evening would be really beautiful before the dinner starts. And uh, welcome to you all again and thank you uh, for giving me opportunity to speak here. Dr. Raghavan Nagar, who might have organized the workshop here, 
He bought the first gene gun when India never seen the gene gun. So he bought the gene gun in the uh, aeroplane and it was a very struggling uh, story that he brought all the way and uh, faced so many questions. So he has been very, um, um, for a long time he has been associated with ICG. So it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Dr. Daniel here um, uh, today's uh, workshop. And uh, he's a, a PhD from, uh, uh, from MPU uh, in biochemistry. And uh, then he has uh, moved as a, a vice chair at uh, W.D. Miller professor at the Department of Basic and Translation Science, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Daniel has developed a novel approach uh, to orally delivering affordable biopharmaceutical, eliminating expensive injections and refrigeration costs. He has developed drugs to treat like dental care, diabetes, hemophilia, pulmonary hypertension, diabetic uh, uh, retinopathy and Alzheimer disease, oral vaccines for cholera, tuberculosis, malaria, polio, and plague. A long list is there. Professor Daniel is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he is the 14th foreign member of Italy 240-year-old National Academy of Science. He has been honored for his groundbreaking work by organizations like American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, and the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and is the recipient of the Bayer Healthcare Global Awards. So, um, if I will uh, keep on uh, adding all the accomplishments he has made, it will be a long list. So, I will give a break here and I invite uh, Dr. Daniel to give his uh, inaugural lecture and enlighten him with the uh, uh, modern work of uh, plant biology. Thank you, Sashi. Thanks for uh, the invitation. As you mentioned, yes, it was 1988 that I was here when I brought the gene gun, and at the customs, uh, I was asked to show the gun license. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting. And uh, Siva Reddy was uh, assisting in the workshop those days. Krishna Kumari was the director. And uh, it's come a long way. And it's wonderful to see Sashi doing very well. A lot of Sashi's postdocs are in Pennsylvania, and I'll show some of their um, work um, uh, today. And uh, I'm going to focus today mostly on human health and um, related to pandemic. At the if not sure whether Pfizer or Moderna vaccine is available in India. If you have had a mRNA vaccine that was developed by our university, so I will, um, I'm glad to um, start the presentation with the vaccination for SARS-CoV-2. And just like any other science, uh, the, even though this is the first mRNA platform vaccine that was approved, um, this patent expires in three years, so it's a very slow and long process. And uh, two of the scientists, um, Kariko and uh, Weissman, and all of this. There is also a plant vaccine made in tobacco, which has uh, this is a tobacco with viral vectors, infected with viral vectors, and the vaccine. All these are the same protein. It's the spike protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, no matter how it's delivered, um, I understand there's a DNA vaccine in India too, so it's all the same protein. And I'll show you in a minute. 
In this case, this is with maybe violet has purified and injected. This is phase one. And it's been approved by Health Canada, but not yet from US FDA. Very two weeks ago they published a phase three, but nowadays when you have phase three, it's emergency use authorization, so it's already been used in uh, humans. And what I'm going to present is all the vaccines that I presented so far requires either purification of protein or mRNA and cold chain associated with that, especially the Pfizer vaccine, it's 80 below zero, and therefore these vaccines that were given, donated to Africa, uh, many times they couldn't be, they couldn't maintain the cold chain. And uh, so our lab had many other labs, it's been a dream for almost 30 years to produce these vaccines in plant cells, which can be freeze dried and shipped without purification and without cold chain. And that's what I'm going to present today. One for therapeutics to treat SARS-CoV-2 and another is to uh, trap the virus and prevent the virus from self-infection or uh, reinfection and transmission. The, in a sense, the vaccines are used all over the globe but transmission is still a problem, right? Many of us have had vaccinations, double shots and boosters and so on, but still we transmit. And that's because the virus, yeah, the vaccine doesn't neutralize the virus on the surface. And so that is one problem. And in fact, the viral load is the same between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And second is that the SARS-CoV-2 replicates in the salivary glands, so it leaves in the saliva. And the transmission orally from the throat and from the saliva is three to five orders of magnitude higher than nasal. If someone sits next to you, doesn't wear a mask, and even if two hours the virus that's transmitted is negligible compared to that person opening their mouth and saying, ah, if they say four words, ah, that is the three to five orders of magnitude more virus coming out. All these studies, excellent studies have been done. So essentially then two problems. One is providing protection through immune system. Second, providing the prevention of transmission. And I'm going to present some of the exciting recent developments in this. But our goal has been to not only develop the medication, but make them affordable. The two highest costs for expenses are purification and the cell culture fermentation. So fermentation, this is the way how pharmaceuticals are produced. It may be different from algae, which can be grown differently, but if it's yeast or E. coli, it follows the FDA guidelines and these fermenters are very expensive and other thing is you have to purify them and inject them. Once you purify the protein, the proteins are highly unstable and therefore they have to be refrigerated. So it is possible to produce these in plant cells, just freeze dry them and orally deliver them. So that has been the goal for 30 years but I am very delighted to present to you today first FDA approved example of this developed in our lab. The third method of delivery is not delivering it to the immune system or system A, but you can topically deliver it. And as I mentioned to you, the viral load is heavy in the throat and in the saliva. If you have a chewing gum to trap the virus and neutralize the virus, then you can decrease transmission. So the third delivery is topical using the chewing gum and that's what has been approved by FDA. To every one of these things, the first requirement is you need to produce truckloads of proteins. And many years ago, I developed the chloroplast technology and this is ideal by every actor because there are 10,000 copies of chloroplast genomes per cell and so you can have 10,000 copies of foreign genes and there is 
these are site specific integrations, so there is no position effect, there is no gene silencing and therefore this has worked very well for us um, for producing several hundred proteins. More recently, we have advanced this further to remove the antibiotic resistant gene. Why is the antibiotic resistant gene necessary? It's because when you shoot them using the gene gun, you have to kill all the untransformed cells. So that you use antibiotic and you have antibiotic resistant gene which is coupled to the gene of interest. But now we have removed them by putting two identical sequences that circle back, use endogenous recombinase and then it just pushes them up. So there is, I don't, uh, I have, all these are published recently. So we have now routinely do this removal of the selectable markers. One other major challenge is that all these genes come from different sources. Human genes put into chloroplast, chloroplast are prokaryotic. So you have to develop a system to optimize the chlorons. So we have built the algorithm for this. Now we can plug it in, get the sequence, and synthesize any human gene or gene of any other kingdom to be introduced. So if you did this, then the ribosomes slide smoothly and they produce a lot of proteins. Otherwise, they get stuck. When we do the ribosome profiling, you could really see that it gets stuck. So you could increase the expression uh, several hundred fold by uh, optimizing quadrant. So we have expressed the largest human protein using this approach. And uh, again, this is published, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But in the next couple of slides, I'll just give you the basic concept. So we have a selectable marker gene, typically it's an ADA gene. We have the genes of interest and uh, we use two flanking sequences and when we shoot them in, it goes and recombines with the endogenous and therefore foreign gene is inserted into the spatial region without disturbing any of the existing uh, genes. And in fact, we use all endogenous plant regulatory sequences so according to USD AFIS, this is not considered genetically modified because there is no pathogenic sequences, viral sequences involved, and there is no pathogen involved like agrobacterium for transformation. So the process is to shoot, choose for the one shoot that we need, and then we can chop them up to multiple pieces, move them to root um, inducing hormones, take them, get the seeds, go to commercial scale. Um, companies, I'll show it in a, in a minute, and then freeze dry them, powder them, and make capsules or chewing gum. And um, many years ago, uh, we have been doing this for 30 years, and uh, we were, before Sashi came to the lab, we did it in tobacco, most of our, and we tried to use nicotine free tobacco, but we could never convince FDA because they say tobacco is tobacco. So it just doesn't matter if, there is, if it's not to go to something else. So Sashi was the first person to use an edible chloroplast transformation system that was with care. And so we were hoping that we will produce all these uh, drugs in carrot. But carrot, uh, unlike tobacco, carrot uses embryogenesis. So it's very difficult to produce large uh, transformation events with carrot. And Sam uh, in the lab, Sam Nalapalli, uh, developed the latest transformation. Both happened at the same time, I think. And uh, so now we, most of the lab uses the latest because in carrot, even if you express it, you have to remove the water. It's difficult to remove water from carrot. But lettuce leaves are very thin. We eat them for uh, salads and therefore uh, FDA approve our uh, uh, drug because lettuce is, there is no immunogenic complaints about lettuce proteins. And so once we make these lettuce seeds, we give this to the um, uh, company. Uh, this is what FDA actually expects, uh, not having human contact because it needs to be virus free, pathogen free and so on. So this 
again, uh, Steve Streetfield is the director of Fraunhofer. This is a, a facility where robots put the seeds in and you will see that the robots move the trays and then the robots will harvest the leaves as well. So this whole thing is uh, set um, very pretty close to our lab. Therefore, we have made a lot of different drug products. So believe it or not, once the leaf is cut, that is the drug product. So there is no purification, no cold chain. Once the leaf is cut, it still has water, but the water needs to be removed. And FDA has a lot of regulatory guidelines to remove water and the moisture content needs to be each batch of the dry powder should provide the moisture content. And in New Jersey, we have the aerofarms, which produces lettuce and supplies to five eastern states, including New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. So they also produce our A2 lettuce. Otherwise, they supply salad lettuce, but for us, they produce the A2 lettuce. So when we compare the Fraunhofer, you know, and uh, Aerofarms, you know, when they sell lettuce, they say we know how to grow it. As you can see, they really don't know how to grow it because they can sell lettuce leaves, but not high protein content. So when we ask them to monitor protein content, their salad leaves were less than half a protein um, what a real lettuce, good lettuce should be. But for us, it's important because our drug is a protein drug. So we look at this and as you can see, um, they, we compare the fresh weight and the dry weight and we need to show the moisture content. And the good news is that one kilogram of dry leaf biomass can produce up to a million gum tablets. So when we develop this to block the SARS-CoV-2 from transmission and infection, we are not targeting only those people who are infected with uh, COVID-19. This is a prophylaxis, so this should be taken by anybody because no one knows when they are going to get infected. And therefore, this is immediately uh, treated. So thankfully, one kilogram can produce up to 800,000 or a billion uh, gum tablets. Some of the other requirements of FDA are how long is the product table? In this case, we show that it's stable up to 150 weeks. So once you dry the plant cells, they stay put. And we have to tell, show FDA how we monitor degradation. And we have shown simply with Western blocks looking at the clean products. And the clean product shouldn't exceed 10% of the full length product. So they allow, we specify that 10% degradation um, is something that would be a variable from batch to batch. And um, the, so there are two examples that I'm going to show you. One is the lettuce which we engineered. We also, if there are countries where they are, uh, have aversion to GMOs, then we also develop the natural bean, this is the fava bean. The bean powder also has a viral trap protein called frill, and I'm going to show you in a minute. These two work very differently. The ACE2 is the enzyme that the virus binds and inactivates. And ACE2 is the receptor through which virus gets in. So you, we naturally produce ACE2 in the saliva and in our plasma. ACE2 is a key metabolic enzyme in our body. But the virus overwhelms the system because there's not enough ACE2 to fight back. So we put ACE2 so that it can fight back, trap the virus, or block the gates by binding to the ACE2 receptor. Frill, on the other hand, binds to the surface glycoprotein on any virus. This is not only for SARS-CoV-2, this is for uh, influenza, HPV, herpes. So it aggregates the virus and traps it with the gut. So either way, it's an envelope protein trapping or the spike protein trapping. And I'll show you the, uh, so this is the mechanism. In case of SARS-CoV-2, the virus has a spike protein. The spike protein binds to ACE2 or uses the ACE2 receptor. 
And interestingly, the virus also uses two GM on receptors. Some of you are working with CTB. So in this case, we made CTB ACE2 so that it blocks both gates of entry. And uh, the good news is when FDA approved CTB ACE2, they also approved CTB. So we can use this as a delivery system. One other thing that was developed at Penn was this is done by simply taking the virus in the saliva, add antibody to it, when the antigen antibody forms a complex, you add hydrogen peroxide to it, and when they form the complex, it removes oxygen from hydrogen peroxide and it forms a bubble. And each bubble is one virus. And so we can really see the bubbles and count how much virus is in the saliva. And we then add gum powder to it, we take the patient, these are all COVID-19 patients in our hospitals, we take the saliva, add the gum powder, and then within few minutes, all the bubbles disappear, so that means they are off track. If it is not trapped, then there will still be enough ACE2 which can go and bind to the receptor and block the entry as well. So the beauty of this is that you only need just one microgram of this in a gum, but each gum has 800 micrograms. Why so is because when people keep chewing, it will keep releasing. The, so it will be a continuous release, so we have about 800 fold more than what is needed. This um, received a lot of attention when this was published. So the bubble sizes also vary from patient to patient. Some of them have lots of small viruses, some of them are much mature viruses and so on. So all these are cell phone photographs of the virus. So FDA also wants a placebo gum, which doesn't have the H2. So we have to show the data to FDA about control patients and with placebo and with H2. And uh, so we have done this um, hundreds and hundreds of uh, patients so far, and that's what was submitted. For flu, we tested this in by actually taking electron micrographs to see how the frill, when you add the frill, it aggregates. Just it sort of binds to the surface glycoprotein, and as you can see with frill, this is influenza virus, Singapore strain. We also tested the California strain. It aggregates so the virus cannot enter into the human cells. So both are trapping with very different mechanisms. So when you use frill, Oh, by the way, the previous slide, I forgot to tell you that it works with different Omicron strain or Delta strain. And different Omicron strains, A, B, um, more recent B versions, we have tested all of those. So it works for different strains. Same thing we tested for flu. You could see this is with Omicron. You could see you add flu. So the good news here is flu doesn't need FDA approval. It's a bean powder. You just take the bean powder make a gum and then deliver it. So this doesn't even need an IND, so we are moving forward. Without that, well, we need exemption from FDA, but bean powder has been eaten for a century, so FDA has no problem. So when you add from with the different uh, strains of influenza, uh, potent strains, they just knock them off, and you only need 25 microgram of bean powder. Again, we have a hundredfold or five hundredfold more of the capacity to, to, to trap. And if it is not trapped, we check how it blocks the entry into human cells. So here we study that using the, um, the virus with infection cells and we can monitor. And again, 50 microgram each gum tablet is two gram and 50 microgram completely blocks the entry as well. And so all those are wonderful things to do in the lab, but from the time you make a protein to get FDA approval, this single slide shows you almost 10 years of work. So this is where the, the slow pace of regulatory approval is. As I said, mRNA vaccine, that was produced uh, developed in our university. It has only three more years of patent life left. That means it takes such a long period. 
So at least we are glad that we got a DA approval because the whole idea of gum, ACE2 we produced almost 10 years ago, but the idea of gum was developed probably two years ago. So in that case, an idea reduced to regulatory approval happened in less than two years. And so during the pandemic, the lab has been uh, pretty active. So these are FDA requirements at every stage. We grow them and what are the conditions we need to specify the age of the plant and water content and everything else and all the growth conditions. What is what type of LED, what kind of uh, everything else, all the way up to making gum. The gum company needs to be FDA approved. So the gum, when you heat the gum to roll it, uh, the protein needs to be stable. So we show the stability of the drug substance and drug product. That's what FDA calls them, plant powder and plant powder in the gum. So we have to do those. And then toxicology studies. Actually, we have to do it twice. First, we did it with Stanford Research Institute, then with uh, uh, Charles Schumann Lab, because FDA rejected the toxicology studies from um, Stanford because they should give these 1,500 doses to animals and then they sacrificed it and did all the studies. But FDA said they should have observed the animals for another 14 days to see what happens to them. And so we have to restart all over again. That added another six months of uh, time. So the clinical trial for this FDA approved, uh, the protocol is pretty straightforward. Each person gets 12 gums. The four gum a day, you chew them for 15 minutes. We take the viral before and after the viral of the saliva, and then that's it. The clinical trial is finished in four days, and then we submit this data for emergency use authorization and commercial scale production to FDA. So that has gone extremely well, and this is the FDA approval. Uh, process, it's pretty expensive actually, just this slide that I'm showing here, each patient to do the 12 gums, the hospital charges me $10,000, so uh, you can see that. So at every stage it's expensive, the toxicologist at Stanford charge $5 million, so all these are writing grants, writing grants, sleepless uh, nights, but ultimately it's all worth it when you get a FDA letter saying that there is no condition to proceed with it. And so this means a drug made in a plant is approved for the first time without cold chain, without purification. So this has kind of opened a door for delivering new drugs orally. In this case, it's topical, but they approved CTB. So we can CTB insulin, CTB everything else. It's all now the drug product is approved. And the toxicology is also done for H2 and insulin, insulin has been used. So this is a pretty big achievement from our, our many, many postdocs and many, many graduate students have worked together. that. The nice thing is scale up. We can make a million H2 gum with one dry kilogram biomass. And uh, the, so this is the latest actually, this is got approved. May 31st. So at this stage, actually, I'll take a brief pause to take some questions because the same H2, when H2 binds, when virus binds to the enzyme, it inactivates the enzyme and it causes a lot of problems in the body. Most people who died, died of respiratory problem, heart failure, and all this I'm going to explain to you the mechanism and therefore our parallel clinical trial is to give ACE2 in capsules to treat the symptoms because that's what the virus is attacking and we want to supplement the ACE2. But um, could I stop here and take some questions? Yes. Uh -huh. I have two questions. <laughs> Actually, 
the Greenock system introduces a recombination and then uh, uh, and the crease sites for the recombination to excise. Thankfully, chloroplasts have its own recombination, which is very good in recombining. And uh, so we are using that, but the basic principle is that you need a minimum of 500 nucleotides identical sequences for it to um, form the stem loop to eliminate. So the challenge in removing the marker by putting this is that we don't know when that happens. Is it happening the whole cassette integration and then that could come back, but then those flanks are not identical. So it doesn't affect the integration, but we cannot predict when the AADA gene is excised, when the anabolic acid gene. So what we do is when we chop them into bring shoots, we plate them on plus and minus antibiotic. So if the marker is removed, it cannot grow in the antibiotic. So we just use the selection process to choose that. Right. So the second part of the talk is going to use the plant cell wall bioencapsulation to protect the protein. It gets through the stomach and then the gut bacteria will release the enzyme to break down the cell wall and then it will be absorbed. So that is oral delivery. For topical delivery, we do not use intact plant cells. We grind them fine so that it is released in the, when you chew the gum, it's broken plant cells, so the enzyme is released immediately and if it will be digested in the stomach, therefore there is minimal absorption from the chewing gum. But for oral delivery, you need to have 90% or greater intact plant cells. Yes? Saliva has a lot of other uh, content when you chew. Uh, right. Chewing gum, so your is is to uh, think doesn't get destroyed at all. Mm -hmm. When you are taking with with the chewing gum, uh -huh. the is two which is released during the in the saliva and mixed along with the saliva the product, it doesn't get destroyed. No, we have tested this. The I will show you actually there is also is two in the saliva mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. So it both are identical proteins. Mm -hmm and it is not uh, degraded at all. And then uh, you are going to tell us the adoption. Right, right, yeah. Right, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. Yes. So the, for chewing gum, we have a 100 to 500 fold excess in the chewing gum and there is no dosage requirement for this because our goal is each individual has different quantities of virus in their saliva. So no one dose can be used. So we use an excess to But this is an enzyme that's naturally present in the saliva. So there's also naturally produced saliva as well. Uh, H2 in the saliva as well. But for when a drug is absorbed, which I'm going to show you in the next part, dosage is absolutely critical. For example, if you use insulin, if you use excess insulin, it will go to hypoglycemia. So I will show you how that is monitored in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on to the, so the next phase, as uh, already from the questions you heard, that the, how is a drug delivered oral? And in this case, as I mentioned, the virus binds to this enzyme. It messes up a key enzyme which is instrumental in regulating the pathway these, uh, which results in, if you look at the people who died of COVID, majority of them had blood pressure, heart disease, and of course diabetes people are prone, but diabetes is not directly impacted by the, the ACE2 enzyme 
impacts heart and lung. So most people need a respirator because they couldn't breathe, because the lung oxygenation was um, destroyed by the down regulation of H2. And so our goal then is to show how can H2 be used as a treatment, because that's the enzyme that the virus inactivates. And so the basic principle here is when a protein is protected in the plant by the plant cell wall, then human enzymes like alpha amylase, they can only break alpha bonds. Human enzyme cannot break beta bonds. And gut microbes can release enzymes that break the beta linkages. And therefore, in the gut, if it is protected from acids, acid pH, and enzymes in the stomach, and then if it gets into the gut, then as you can see in the bottom panel, the green cells are plant cells with GFP. But then you see GFP jump from plant cell to the gut epithelial cell. How did that happen? It happens because the gut bacteria breaks down the cell wall, and then we put a tag, that's a CTB tag, which we, which we FDA just recently approved the ACE2, and CTB binds to GMO and transmucosally delivers into the epithelial cells. So that's the mechanism. Protection in the stomach, open release in the gut lumen, absorption into the epithelium. So that's the process. And so we can do dose dependent delivery. This is where dose H comes absolutely. FDA really is critical about dose dependent delivery. This means FDA's question was, is there a difference among people's gut bacteria? Will it impact the release? And is there a difference in breakdown of the plant cell wall? So we make sure that greater than 90% of plant cells are intact. And um, then once we deliver it, we could, all the fibrotic lung fibrosis in COVID patients and inflammation, and pulmonary vascular remodeling and artery arterial pressure, all these things can be reversed just by two weeks of taking these capsules. These are people who are advanced who have, uh, and in fact, one of the common symptoms is the, you can see the right ventricle in healthy patients, it pumps well, but it gets enlarged when H2 is inactive. H2 activity is decreased. So when we give them back, it comes back to the restores the function. I can show you how the, the this in a video. If you observe carefully, the ventricle, right ventricle is so enlarged, it cannot pump. But if you can see after two weeks of treatment, it restores 98% of pumping capacity. And uh, so both the lung and the heart symptoms can be reversed by uh, oral delivery of H2. So how does then this H2, what happens to this enzyme in COVID patients? As you can see, all these are patients in our hospital. The blue dots are people who don't have COVID, COVID negative. And the ones with COVID, you can see that the red dots are dramatically drops the H2 activity. And initially when we observed this, people said that, well, this is maybe due to the sample, uh, we have some anticoagulants, uh, EDTA in the uh, tube, so um, some disagreed with that, so we did without EDTA, with EDTA and combined data. Even more interesting is H2 in saliva. So the H2 in saliva, the blue is healthy, the red is COVID. You could see enzyme, whether it's H2 in plasma or saliva, the virus binds it knocks up the activity of spike protein. So feeding this then restores the, the activity. You may see some blue dots uh, in healthy patients at the bottom. These are smokers. When people smoke, that also affects the H2 um, activity. So, so saliva, we developed this H2 as a marker because right now in the US, when you do PCR tests, 
if the CDC, when somebody is positive, the CDC doesn't recommend testing again for 90 days. That's because the even the virus, even when it's inactive, which cannot infect, still it will be PCR positive. So there are more biomarkers are needed. So we have developed H2 as a biomarker as well. So there are a lot of clinical trials. One of these is with convalescent plasma. You can see when people get convalescent plasma, the H2 level goes back up. And so it's a pretty interesting observation that we have developed this. So it's not only H2 activity, but also H2 enzyme product is called N17. So either you measure N17 or you measure H2 uh, activity. Surprisingly, when we got autopsy samples in the early stages, a lot of people died of COVID. So we had a lot of autopsy samples. So we thought H2 in the lung will be affected, but our uh, immunostaining showed that there is no difference between control and H2. So mostly H2, soluble H2 in plasma and saliva is what is affected. So we have developed this as a biomarker um, and treatment. So this clinical trial, unlike the H2 gun, which is for three days, this one is for two weeks, and we treat patients in the emergency room, in the hospitals, I give them and we monitor this. So this is another uh, trial that is ongoing. So with that, I will just conclude moving forward from pandemic to diseases that are common like diabetes. And for 50 years, insulin is available all over the world, but many of it is still not affordable. And so we are developing actually insulin oral versus injectable. The nice thing with oral is when we take oral insulin, the sugar level goes slowly down. Unlike you can see in the right panel, the red is injection, it just drops the sugar levels very quickly. And it also goes to hypoglycemia. Below 150, 100 is hypoglycemia. But that doesn't happen with the um, oral insulin. Finally, we are also using the chewing gum to break down the plaque and kill the bacteria that cause dental caries and gingivitis that hide under it. These plaque, as you all may have experienced, that you go to a dentist, they mechanically scrape. There is no biological way of uh, breaking this down. Um, actually, the green is bacteria, the red is the extracellular matrix that they secrete. So even if you have Listerine or antibiotic, it cannot reach the bacteria. So it's impossible to treat them. So we have developed this chewing gum with this enzyme which breaks its dextrinase mutinase, it digests the extracellular matrix, and then more importantly, it's also lipase. Lipase uh, destroys the fungal colonies as well. So it is both candida and step mutants, both are. Uh, so this is another thing which uh, we are using the chewing gum approach. And um, this needs actually three enzymes, and we make them enzyme mixture in the, um, so in summary, then this chewing gum is a new approach that we have developed, which is a topical delivery, which could be used to treat a number of oral viruses. It's not only SARS-CoV-2, influenza, flu, and herpes, HIV, and all these things are transmission, could be controlled using the particles. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, transmission happens for viruses mostly through oral particles and minimally through nasal. And therefore, it is important to control uh, transmission. Of course, at this stage, for we have to do for um, phase three to get an emergency use authorization, we have to do 500 to 1,000 patients. You know, as you can imagine, the cost each patient at the clinic charges at least 10, which is excludes for not the production costs and so on. It's pretty expensive. It helps to have patents. So those of you who are doing clinical translation or any translation for the matter, please protect your IP before you publish. Otherwise, 
you, you can't find people to, to fund the research. So I also wanted to conclude that I was thinking a lot how ICGV with all these years of interaction with, uh, and Sashi being here, that a lot of things that potentially um, collaborative project would be done, the joint funding in the US funding, many of that uh, for the pandemic, the chewing gum, again, could be clinically tested here. Uh, right now we are doing a clinical testing in Uganda, in Africa and other uh, countries and um, other continents, so it would be good to, to look at that. And also diabetes is a global epidemic and uh, so that is uh, oral insulin is something that we can do. Uh, Shashi already has done oral artemisinin, but that's using artemisia, right? This is something that uh, uh, could be extended to other edible systems as well. I did talk about biomass biofuels, but we have developed a lot of enzymes uh, related to biomass conversion. None of this happens without a lot of funding, as I mentioned. The, uh, I was fortunate to, um, to receive funding. And just the pandemic, this COVID that I presented, it's a huge team, an entire village works together on a given day, 40, 50 people work on this uh, project. And as you can see, most of them are in the clinic, clinical directors and regulatory um, agencies and so on. And uh, most importantly, all the graduate students and uh, regulatory agencies that uh, recognize our work. We got a lot of publicity with this chewing gum, with uh, a lot of news coverage. And uh, that publication had about 1.8 million Twitter exchanges. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a pretty um, nice thing to, uh, to, to see work getting uh, usefully translated from the lab to the clinic. And with that, I'll conclude and we'll be glad to answer questions. Yes. Another important aspect is the mucosal immunity. You know that uh, for the, because viral goes through the nasals and mucosal immunity is also it is uh, usually not generated that good. So can you encapsulate this uh, kind of thing so that it can be taken with steam? Uh, this one? Are you, sorry, I, if I understand, are you talking about nasal, intranasal delivery? Yeah, intranasal delivery, when we take the steam, like gelatin, uh, you can take many other wigs and other right. things. You know, you take right, it. So right. So similar, if you can, we some stability. Sure. And then take through nasal roots mm -hmm. some of these things. Right. Then the transmission itself through this route is also prevented. For transmission, it probably will not work because the virus replicates in the salivary glands. So then the it, initial site is the throat where it lodges and then it continuously replicates in the, viral, in the salivary glands. So nasal passage has nothing to do with viral replication. And on the, in advanced cases of disease, there's the upper lung and the lower lung. The lower lung infection is where they need the intubators. And that is because the virus has multiplied so much. And uh, nasal delivery has so far failed. Nasal insulin was developed many years ago and uh, it got approved by FDA, but then there was not enough patient um, population to use that because of the limited nasal surface. So uh, for drug delivery, actually gut is the largest absorption surface, so we prefer gut. And nasal also is supposed to give mucosal immunity but then again, there are not, as you can see, so many vaccines got approved, none nasal. So the nasal continues to be a problem because of limited surface. No, I'm talking about the flu, but in particular, not for the insulin and others, but mm -hmm. for the flu viruses, 
this is a, one of the things which people are believing that that some of the virus can be neutralized in the nasal region and they will not even infect the upper uh, the, 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 the third kind of right right as i said it depends on even for chewing gum it just needs to be continuously released okay so if there is a nasal spray which is done every 30 minutes and so on possibly it might work because the, you need a continuous supply of the viral trap protein. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, I have again two questions. One is, uh, is there any uh, harmful effect of excess of S protein in the blood? Because you will be given through gingam or through intestinal delivery, if in a healthy individual you have more S2 than what uh, could be a negative effect of it on the health? Yeah, for systemic delivery, we, our dose is the same level as it's naturally present in the healthy human body. Which, so our delivery there is 400 micrograms. That is the level that's seen in the plasma. And uh, in fact, H2 has been injected for COVID-19 patients as well. And uh, so they needed to inject twice because the level um, in the plasma degrades it. And therefore, yes, the dosage for any systemic delivery, you have to maintain the dose. So there is no question of giving higher dose. It's the same level as in the healthy patient. Yeah, okay. The second question, right now people are also exploring other microbial hosts for delivering drugs, for example, yeast or bacteria because they are commercial to the gut. Mm -hmm. So, is there any advantage using plant as a delivery system for the drug as compared to other microbes? Absolutely. So, insulin is now sold by two commercial methods. One is E. coli. The other one is yeast. E. coli, they make A chain, B chain form disulfate bonds in vitro. Yeast makes with, with disulfate bondage, it's uh, secreted. Both are the two systems, no, no disc is yeast. LIV is um, E. coli. I think probably um, Majumdar's is also E. coli, I think. Um, th that's why I can't. Uh, so none of them can be given oral because you have to purify from yeast and E. coli proteins. So the biggest advantage is eliminate the purification cost. Second, insulin needs to be stored cold. If people are going on cruise for longer than two weeks, then they have a problem there for what called storage and maintaining. So plant cells, as I showed you, insulin in plant cells can be stored for ambient temperature for many months and years. So the two advantages of plants are stability at ambient temperature. Second is no need for purification. That translates into huge cost advantage. Yeah, I understand. No, but, but I was a little different question I was asking. Mm -hmm. For example, Saccharomyces surrentro. Mm -hmm. This is required for healthy gut maintenance, like a prebiotic. If it can be used as a delivery system because it's already passed on the gut, it can keep making yeah, insulin. Yeah, I, I always wonder, lactobacillus would be another good um, way to do it. And I'm not really sure why there's a lot of people who propose lactobacillus and other um, things for delivery. Has Nothing has come to the, uh, that I am aware of, come to the clinical testing level. So one thing that I know with the lactobacillus is it needs to be secreted. When it is secreted, it gets digested at the stomach enzymes. So it needs to not secrete while in the stomach, but you need to induce secretion when it reaches the gut. And then the protein needs to cross the gut as well. 
So you could make the same tag, put it in lactobacillus, but I think the problem has been secretion, timing of secretion or programming of secretion. But I, I'm sure if plant cells can do it, there should be other cell systems that could do it as well. Thank you. Phase 2 is fused with CTV, so CTV forms a pentamer and when it's in a pentameric form it binds to GM1 and GM1 is a ubiquitous receptor present in all cell types and a very heavily loaded in the gut epithelium. So it binds to GM1 and GM1 ACE2 is transmucose and we have engineered a furin cleavage site. Furin is a ubiquitous protease and it cleaves it off. So when we measure in plasma, we don't see CTV ACE2, we only see ACE2. So the process is first GM1 forming pentamer and chloroplast form disulfide bombs and forms the pentamer. And then it, uh, cell needs to be opened, it binds transmucoses. And then once transmucose delivery is done, the CTB needs to be cleaved out. <laughs> so, uh, did you had uh, some additional, uh, you know, safety thing to study because uh, getting approval with CTV would be a bit challenging, right? Yeah, good question. So CTV is used as a vaccine for cholera. And that has been approved over 50 years. And in fact, CTV um, in many countries, even in Canada, it's available, CTV tablet, it's available over the counter without prescription for travelers' diarrhea. And uh, so I, that. I, I, sorry, I remember there was a time when uh, getting CTV in India was banned because. <laughs> so you could not import CTVs. So. <laughs> huh? Well, just to make an order yeah. to a Canadian. <laughs> 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 so, I, I don't know. One of, I think, Sachi's students also mentioned it's difficult to get CTV. You take, wait for so long. I'm, that's totally new to me because our lab CTV they get in buckets. So, oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was bad. I, I can tell yeah. uh, somewhere around uh, 2000, 2005, 2010, uh, it was difficult to get CTV. So. Yeah, so I, I, I'm so, not aware of the problem, but what I'm saying is from a clinical perspective, the reason we use CTV is it is so widely already used for oral delivery. And this is part of the reason why our CTV is to FDA approved based on the extensive use of CTV. Okay, thanks. Sir, thank you so much for your mind-blowing plant-based vaccine-related work. Uh, that really uh, honored how much uh, contributed in the humanity and will we contribute more. Sir, I have a very general question to you. Uh, cell culture of this lettuce uh, will have difference than growing whole plant because uh, I found that you all tried about the whole plant growing for the extraction, not extraction, I mean preparing uh, this uh, oral vaccine or gum extract or whatever. But oh, why not cell culture? Is there any drawback uh, doing cell culture of lettuce for this purpose? Uh, good question again. Actually, the first plant made pharmaceutical was made in carrot cells by Pepsi glucose or Baracidase to treat Gaucher's disease. So that was approved, which made by Protalix. That was approved almost 10 years ago. So that was the first plant made pharmaceutical uh, developed in plant cell culture. The only, I'm not sure why the carrot made, uh, cell culture made glucose or brassidase cost the same as Cho cells. It could be business reason or the 
the company says most of the cost is in purification. So they try to orally deliver uh, the glucocerebrosinase as we do. They freeze dry it, and, but the expression level is very low. So if somebody could increase the uh, expression level 104, then carrot cells and cell culture for the lettuce should work. I don't see any, in fact, FDA would really like it because they like to approve cell culture. This is the first time they approved a plant uh, produced uh, without purification. The glucose cerebrosis was purified and injected. So there is no problem with cell culture to my knowledge except cost. Because uh, cell culture uh, will reduce time and uh, if a bioreactor in the bioreactor uh, can produce lots of cells mm -hmm. in one time and then directly cell uh, could be lipolyzed and then uh, could be used. So uh, in my uh, experience I thought those are the benefits but I don't know if those uh, 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 nutraceuticals is not extracellular then uh, not have any problem but I'm not sure uh, about this uh, if there are other approval procedure either they have any reservation. Well you have a published paper from Protalix trying to orally deliver and in that paper they show that they have to increase the expression level a hundredfold in order for them to deliver orally. They, when they deliver glucose and orally in carrot cell culture, free strike cell culture the levels of efficacy was uh, tenfold less. So, so, if, so, so their conclusion was you have to increase expression in order for that to work. Thank you, So uh, we will take a small tea break now uh, for 10 minutes and we'll congregate again for Professor Mock's talk.
smoke is a species in genome editing and diatomic studies. So he obtained his PhD uh, in two, 2003 at uh, Bremen University, Chairman, and joined the University of East Anglia, UEA, in 2007. He was a direct postdoctoral fellow at the School of Oceanography, University of Washington, US. His research mainly aims to identify fundamental biological processes that govern the adaptations and evolution of marine phytoplankton in the oceans. Marine phytoplankton contribute about 50% of annual global carbon fixation. It's very important point that 50% CO2 is fixed by the, this phytoplankton. Thus, their adaptation and evolution in the context of biotic and abiotic interaction in different marine systems from tropics to the poles does not only shape marine food webs but also biogeochemical cycles that drive. So, he is a very uh, uh, great person in genome editing work in diatoms, and uh, I would uh, like to hear uh, his talk and I hope you will enjoy. Please give me a hand. Thank you, um, Shashi. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Uh, if not, please um, shout. Um, thanks for bringing me here, Shashi. Also, our collaboration goes way back uh, many, many years, and I've had a wonderful student, PhD student in my lab uh, from your group, and uh, we were teaching her uh, how to genetically modify um, uh, algae, which we do. Um, so, just to warn you, my talk will be very different to the talk you have heard from uh, Henry um, Daniel. Um, it will be focusing on marine organisms, uh, which are not as advanced as plants. Um, I will focus on algae. Uh, we are still have a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, things to catch up with when it comes to comparing algae research with plant research because our uh, uh, field is much, much smaller. So, um, but therefore, Sashi gave me a title and uh, the title he gave me didn't contain the word uh, fundamental. So I've edited it because what we still need to be doing in our field is really to look at the diversity of algae because there are, there, there are so many different species out there we have no clue about. And to me this is a huge resource for um, novel um, chemicals, for novel mechanisms underpinning global biogeochemical cycles and underpinning these uh, vast um, food webs we have in the largest of all ecosystems on Earth. And this is the oceans, of course. So um, with that, um, i like to um, show you the structure of my talk. Uh, it will be divided in uh, three parts. So the first part will address the question about algal biodiversity and how to use um, uh, algal biodiversity for bioprospecting. And we do this from pole to pole. We do this gene by gene and genome by genome. And this ad addresses basically the discovery of the uh, model, so not only identifying genes that potentially are of interest uh, for biotechnology. We also want to hopefully identify novel model species we can use in the lab um, uh, as tools for either biotechnology. The second part will be uh, introducing um, CRISPR-Cas uh, methods. Um, uh, we have pioneered CRISPR-Cas in diatoms in uh, 2006. This was done by one of my postdocs. Uh, together with uh, a collaborator at the Norwich Research Park um, and I will present some data and how we can use CRISPR-Cas uh, for algae synthetic biology. And the last part will be about our startup, uh, it's called Omicron CR, our startup to help you, I have a little present uh, for all of you in the room, to help you with algal slash plant synthetic biology based on CRISPR-Cas if you're interested in applying CRISPR-Cas based genome editing to address your questions, and this is, can be any, really any question. Um, so as we, or as you uh, may know, the ocean contains uh, contain really the majority of biodiversity on our planet. At the same time, they are the least explored habitats, specifically when it comes to polar oceans and the deep sea. And they cover, they cover a significant part of the um, Earth's surface, yet our understanding about the biodiversity very, very limited because 
most likely of access issues. It's very difficult to get to the poles, it's very difficult to get to the uh, deep sea, but technology advances. So for me, bioprospecting the oceans in a sustainable way, therefore, will help to address grand challenges. And this could be, as we have seen in a, a previous talk, antibiotic resistance, food shortage, pandemics, consequences of global climate change, because the oceans are a focal point of addressing um, global climate change, because they're impacted and they, uh, uh, they give us 50% of the oxygen we, we, we breathe. So we need to look after the oceans uh, in, a, in a sustainable way, basically. Um, and this gives you an idea uh, about um, what the diversity on a very, very high level looks like in the surface ocean when it comes to a phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is a very diverse group of organisms. They contain prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes. And the most abundant uh, ones are shown here in green. This is Prochlorococcus, this is cyanobacterium. We have Synergococcus in blue, flagellates, uh, they would contain dinoflagellates, for instance, and the group of diatoms I mainly work with. And this animation shows you over a seasonal cycle how, how much dynamic is uh, involved in, uh, in, uh, in how these organisms are distributed uh, across the surface ocean. You see this, and how they're distributed in general. So you see, for instance, the group of diatoms and flagellates, they're mainly distributed where we have cold water where we have upwelling systems, and so on. And you have where we have more stable situations, like in the North Atlantic, for instance, here, or in the South Atlantic, these ecosystems are dominated by cyanobacteria. And the most abundant one is Prochlorococcus, and then we have Sundenechococcus Syn as well. And they are there because these oceans are limited by nutrients. And the polar oceans, they have much more nutrients and um, uh, to sustain or yeah, to sustain basically more productive um, ecosystems underpinned by diatoms and um, larger phytoplankton species. So what we did is um, a couple of years ago, uh, we started uh, with a pole to pole um, expedition crossing the Atlantic Ocean for assessing marine microalgal biodiversity, including their microbiome. So no organism in the uh, ecosystem uh, lives just by itself. It's always associated with other organisms. And we know this very well. They are called microbiomes. Um, and uh, microalgae, they are quite often associated with prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria. And so, so we need to look at these communities, at these microbiomes also, in order to understand how microalgal biodiversity is being generated, has evolved over the last hundreds of millions of years. So what we did is um, we went with an icebreaker to the Arctic Ocean and then all the way down from here uh, to uh, uh, the Antarctic continent and we sampled on a very um, frequent um, basis. And just to remind you, for those who are not so familiar with oceanography, how um, you know, there is a very strong te uh, temperature gradient, which is obvious, but this temperature gradient also impacts the oceanography of the surface ocean. And what, what we know that above about 40 degrees north and 40, uh, uh, below 40 degrees south, you have seasonally mixed surface ocean ecosystems. Right? And this has consequences for the productivity because if they are seasonally mixed, you always have nutrients that are coming up to the surface. Therefore, they sustain productive systems. And then you have between 40 and 40, you have permanently stratified surface oceans where the nutrient supply is much lower. Okay? And this has consequences for the biodiversity of, um, of these oceans, at least when it comes to phytoplankton biodiversity. So what we did is we did a survey based on phylogenetic marker genes. We use 16S and 18S RDNA, but only, let's say, from the Arctic north of Greenland to uh, uh, around here, south of um, uh, South Africa. And then we did, because we wanted also to, uh, to explore the genescape of these communities, we did a pole-to-pole -pole survey, and this was the first ever done for eukaryotic, uh, eukaryote enriched metatranscriptomes. And here again, we measure the temperature in the surface ocean. This very much uh, mix, uh, uh, matches what I have uh, showed in the previous slide. Temperature from the poles steadily increases with the hottest temperature at tropics and uh, we have again mixed 40 north, 40 south and in the middle is more stratified. 
Nutrients um, uh, are more or less all over the place, with the exception of the Southern Ocean. We have a strong increase in uh, nutrients that are um, needed uh, by phytoplankton, and this is largely nitrate, nitrite, uh, phosphate, and silicon. The reason uh, why these nutrients are so high is because the Southern Ocean is limited by dissolved iron. So these micronutrients, they can accumulate, and this is very different in uh, other parts, at least of this transect. So uh, what we did is uh, we looked at the diversity of these um, algal communities, but also associated uh, bacterial and archaeal communities. And what you see on the left-hand side here is the beta diversity of these communities in relation to temperature. So we looked at all environmental variables uh, to see what kind of variable drives microbial diversity in the surface ocean the most for 16S and 18S. And on the right hand side you see alpha diversities. And these are all the stations, they got numbers, and um, the, the, this is what we knew. So if you look at local diversity, there is a clear um, a correlation with temperature. So the warmer it gets, the higher is the diversity of microbial communities in the surface ocean. This was known. This was unknown. This was unknown. So we saw that when we really go from low temperatures to high temperatures, that this is not a continuum, as we see here. There are break points in the beta diversity, which describes dissimilarities between communities. So we looked at adjacent communities on this global scale and you know, compared local diversity uh, between these communities. And the beta diversity gives us these break points at around you know, 10 degrees Celsius and maybe 15, 16 degrees Celsius. And um, then we did more or less the same exercise for um, the metatranscriptome sequences and again, in relation to temperature, this was the only environmental variable that gave us this kind of result. For all the other environmental variables we tested, there were no breakpoints. It was more like a scatter plot. But here we also see a, a, a very significant breakpoint at around 17 degrees Celsius. And this matches relatively well with the predicted ecological boundary between mixed surface ocean ecosystems and stratified ocean ecosystems. And this was also unexpected, that we see this um, ecological boundary basically in meta-omics data sets from the surface ocean. And if you just plot so this is just, again, um, a correlation with temperature, but if you block the beta diversity from really um, the um, north um, a part of our transect to the Antarctic continent, you see the separation in cold water, between cold water ecosystem and warm water ecosystem, which very nicely matches um, uh, how, how these um, um, ecological boundaries um, match uh, across the surface ocean, and not only for the Atlantic, but also for the Pacific. So then we look at co-occurrences in order to uh, get an idea about who occurs with whom in the ocean. And um, this is for 16S and 18S to get an idea how species co-occur. And this is just for the metatranscriptomes. Uh, they are only eukaryotic metatranscriptomes, I have to say. But what you see here, these hairballs, you, can, you, can, you cannot digest this. But what you see here, there are certain hubs. They are highlighted in orange. And these hubs basically mean that either the genes or the organisms here in the lower part, they connect with most of the, or with, yeah, with, with the, most of the other species uh, we have identified with our study. And here for the genes, they would connect, they would form networks, basically, other genes in our meta in our meta transcriptomes. Um, and um, just to give some to add some names to all these um, to all these networks, we see in the warm network, and we only found two really these warm and cold networks. You see some species you would expect, like I I talked about before, Synechococcus, Prochlorococcus. Uh, Prochlorococcus here, um, and we have other bacteria as well as um, uh, fungi and algae, very well known to be occurring in these warm and stratified ecosystems. The cold network is um, characterized by um, also algae we know very well to occur in these uh, more temperate and polar ecosystems, 
uh, for instance, Pheocystis cordata. We have also diatoms here, we, uh, uh, such as Actu, uh, Actunin cyclus. And um, uh, for bacteria, Colvelia, uh, Polaribacter. So they have all um, uh, clades very well known to occur in more polar and cool ecosystems. And then we uh, went a step further. Um, because to identify sequences and to annotate functions to sequences is only the first step. But you want to put all these genes in an environmental context, uh, in, 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 in a genomics context, because this gives you then better ideas how these genes evolved, and you can also then identify species on the genome level. And this is what Anthony Duncan did, and his paper was just published in Microbiome where um, uh, from selected stations we retrieve the first metagenome assembled genomes, Max, maybe some of you are familiar um, uh, with this approach, uh, for algal microbiomes. And um, the journal produced a very nice um, video I'm going to show now, it's just a minute or so, which introduces this paper and then after that I will give you some more um, details. So these are diatoms, for instance, in the background um, with their silica shells. You see the plastids in the middle, and they play a very sig uh, significant role, especially when nutrients become available and when temperatures are low. Yeah, and we looked at 11 sites from the Arctic, uh, five from the Arctic, and six from the, um, from the Atlantic. and they were very clearly differentiated, which means basically that the environment shapes not only who is there, but also who associates with whom. So um, with that, um, I'd like to give you some more um, insights into the study because it was the first of this kind. Um, these are the stations um, the video was um, uh, showing. So we had these Arctic polar stations and then here are some uh, tropical and subtropical stations. This is just how the metagenomes look like. And most of the reads came from bacteria, but then we also had a lot of um, reads from eukaryotes, which was expected because we were targeting the chlorophyll A maximum layer in the surface ocean, which can be between 10 and let's say 100 meter depth. And then what Anthony um, uh, did, he was starting a binning project, uh, yeah, a binning of all these um, sequences. In red, you see the uh, uh, tropical and subtropical stations, and in blue and turquoise, you see the polar stations. And if you do the spinning, uh, then you reduce the data set significantly because not all of the reads that really are um, uh, can be used in order to reconstruct these mega genome assembled genomes. But we ended up with um, a significant number of these maps for prokaryotes and for eukaryotes, uh, and this shows you a little bit um, a little bit of the eukaryotic um, uh, genomic diversity based on meta genomes. You see a phylogenetic tree with a lot of reference genomes here, um, uh, but everything that has these tags here, uh, red and blue, these are our newly assembled metagenome assembled genomes from phytoplankton um, taxa. And um, you see here, in, so those with a red color, they come from the warm part of the Atlantic, and those with blue color, they come from the Arctic. And you see that we could um, assemble some uh, brazinophyte um, um, algal maps on one hand, and here on the other hand, we found also a lot of um, diatom algal maps 
but many more from the Arctic, as seen here in blue, than uh, the uh, non-polar surface waters of the Atlantic Ocean. So this gives you some idea what you can do uh, based on metagenomes in order to get genomic information of um, uh, algal species for which no cultures exist in any uh, in any um, uh, um, culture um, facilities. So and these are the prokaryotic max. They are much easier to assemble because um, they 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 uh, they are usually not polyploids, uh, and the genomes are much smaller, as you know. And uh, we found many bacteriodetes, for instance, and uh, also archaea, gamma proteobacteria, and um, alpha proteobacteria. And you can use now these 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 genomic resources in order to mine for genes you are interested in. And this is what we did. Um, we looked, um, my group is very much interested in um, exploring and developing the CRISPR-Cas technology for making it available to the algal um, community. And um, most of the Cas enzymes um, everyone is using um, come from um, uh, Streptomyces um, species pyrogens, for instance, and we want to increase the number of Cas enzymes available for genome editing. And this heat map here uh, on top shows you uh, some retrieved Cas um, uh, genes from um, our um, uh, metagenomes. Um, so these are just the Cas genes from metagenomes without association to uh, metagenome assembled genomes. But here at the bottom you see that you can also retrieve um, Cas uh, operons, which is very nice because then you have the genomic context and in this case we found um, an operon that even included the CRISPR repeats and this helps us then to find PEM regions in order really to make use of these novel Cas enzymes in any uh, biotechnological um, applications uh, you want to develop for your, for your uh, species of interest. Um, so we used um, the coverage of these um, sequences, and this is here given in a million reads, uh, to identify also um, again who co-occurs with whom uh, as part of the concept, as part of the microbiome concept. So you can not only do this for individual genes, you identify by either amplification of um, uh, target genes, taxonomic marker genes, or these metatranscriptomes, you can also do this by looking at the max and see which one is co-occurring with which one across the entire global ocean. And we did this for the Atlantic. Here on top you see the prokaryotes and the abundance I've listed. We have listed some uh, prokaryotic max here on the left um, um, for the um, uh, polar, for the Arctic, and on the right these max um, have been retrieved from the warmer Atlantic surface waters. And what you see is that most of these MACs are really um, constrained to uh, either the Arctic or the warm um, Atlantic surface ocean. Some are in both um, ecosystems, like this um, species, for instance, we have evidence that it is, um, was found in the Arctic as well as in the um, warmer surf uh, surface ocean. And then we looked, by looking at the coverage and looking at the similarity of coverage, then we identified co-occurring species between, and we were very much interested in, uh, in uh, finding uh, co-occurrences between um, algae and um, prokaryotes. They represent the microbiomes of the surface ocean. And here in the lower part, you have the algae, the eukaryotes, and wherever you see it, wherever you see this yellow um, color, this means co-occurrences have been found, and they were highlighted with the um, dark circles, for instance. Um, you can find here uh, uh, MAC, that has a dark circle in here, so this means that these species, they show co-occurrence patterns across latitudinal gradients. And this is um, then what we, um, uh, what we showed in the paper, where you see uh, this is an example of three co-occurrences, and this is um, Bacillococcus with Erythrobacter, therefore they uh, form co-occurrences across um, several stations indicated by the um, uh, clear correlation in their relative normalized abundance of reeds. And then what we also did, we tried to identify if there is shared metabolism. And this was a little bit more difficult because we need to have a control set. You cannot just look at the metabolism you identified in these co-occurring um, uh, species associations. Um, you need a control for this. And what we did is, we uh, looked at um, uh, the same taxa 
but for which we did not have any evidence that they co-occurred over several stations. And this information was then used uh, together to identify metabolism that, that was enriched in these co-occurring taxa. And here you see specific molecular functions based on uh, GO enrichment exercise. And uh, just to summarize all these diverse functions, here you have a cellular component. And what is very encouraging, we found uh, uh, metabolic processes enriched uh, that were related to Golgi membrane uh, for the uh, eukaryotes and for the prokaryotes of the outer membrane. And you can imagine if you have species who are really tightly co-occurring and who, um, who exchange metabolites, processes, membrane-associated processes are very important for, um, for establishing these associations in the surface ocean. So the conclusion of, for the first part of my talk is that yes, we can use ocean metagenome surveys and ours uh, was called Sea of Change. Uh, more well known is Tara Oceans and maybe some of you know uh, uh, this metagenome um, survey that has been done over the last about 15 years. They really enable to extend the genomic diversity of algal genomes and their microbiomes. And we think this is, could be a great source of uh, novel biodiversity, not only for gene mining when it comes to individual genes you're interested in, you can do this all the time, but also for gene mining in a genomic context. And this is uh, especially important when you are more interested in identifying pathways, for instance, right? And you want to have pathways coming from maybe the same organism, and therefore these MACs, they can be very helpful. So now I come from these more biodiversity-driven um, uh, uh, studies to, uh, um, to studies we have done over the last five to ten years to establish CRISPR-Cas um, for either biotechnology based on work we did with diatoms. And we have two models in the lab. One is Thalassocyrus sulunana, which almost looks like this. And this is centric diatom and uh, Fragilaiopsis cylindrus, which is a penguin diatom. And as I said before, this work was mainly done by Amanda Hopes in my lab. So in these, um, this part of my talk is based on two papers. We published uh, one in Nature Methods, where we not only looked at diatoms, but, uh, but uh, looked at a lot of marine protest, protists as emerging model organisms. So it was... Uh, uh, a significant collaborative effort uh, from groups across the world, basically, in order to develop new genetic tools to make these very important organisms um, to emerging models. And this paper is the paper that gave first evidence that CRISPR-Cas can be used in marine algae um, uh, to uh, uh, genetically engineer them. So, um, where are the uh, um, diatoms? from who we are working with. So Thalassocyrus sulunana is shown here on top. Uh, and Thalassocyrus sulunana is a coastal species. It lives, uh, is very widespread um, uh, uh, across all oceans, uh, but lives mainly in temperate and coastal areas. It requires higher concentrations of nutrients. And then on the other hand, Fragilopsis cylindrus is a penate diatom. They're relatively small, just a few micrometer in diameters. And um, Fragilopsis is a very abundant species, also um, considered a bloom former in the Southern Ocean, where we have a lot of these diatoms anyway, but also in the Arctic Ocean. And it lives in sea ice as well, not only in the water. For those of you who, don't, who do not know diatoms, this is what their diversity looks like. It's the most diverse group of um, algae, uh, over 100,000 species. We don't know how this diversity has been generated, to be honest, but they are very beautiful organisms, as you can see. Um, the unifying concept is that almost all of them produce a silicified cell wall called frustrum. And uh, these cell walls they can be very um, elaborate, as you can see here, with nano patterns. Um, and these nano patterns are species specific, and they are very, uh, very much um, uh, used in nanobiotechnology because um, engineers are interested in understanding how these diatoms can form these nano patterns. And this is a little bit about the phylogeny of diatoms, who basically have one, two, three, four main groups. One group is called the a uh, is called the a wafered penates. We have uh, uh, radial centrics that look like this. We have polar centrics, and Thalassocyrus sulunana is 
um, part of this plate, it looks almost like that. And we have the group of the raphid penates, and they look like this. They have an opening in their cell wall, which is called rafe, and uh, hence the name. And Fragilaiopsis is part of this group, as well as the other model species, Pheodactylum uh, triconutum. Both of them belong to the raphid penates. And um, for Thalassocera pseudonana and Fragilaiopsis cylindrus, we know they are very abundant. Uh, in the global ocean, and this is based on a Tara survey where they looked at ADNS um, ribosomal genes and their occurrence across all stations um, they sampled um, across all oceans. And the most abundant diatom uh, ribotypes are Ketotsuros, then the second one is Thalassocera, and the fourth one is Fragilaiopsis. So we work with organisms that are environmentally important and this is also a very important criterion in my group that we have model species that have relevance in the field uh, in order to understand uh, in order to understand the environment basically so uh, the genome of Thalassocera was sequenced in 2004 um, and this was the first uh, marine algal um, uh, um, uh, genome as well as diatom genome uh, to be released and published. It's a model for biosilicification, it's a model for metabolic engineering, and uh, genome editing is possible via CRISPR Cas developed in my lab. Uh, we published the genome of Fra Fra Fragilaiopsis in 2007. It's a model for polar adaptation, as I said, because it lives in polar oceans as well as in uh, there in sea ice, and it's transfor transformable. And with that, it's the first polar um, eukaryotic organism that has become transformable over the years. We, uh, this year, released a book uh, with the title The Molecular Life of Diatoms, um, which um, puts together all the knowledge in our field, basically. So if you are interested to learn more about specifically molecular biology of diatoms, uh, please read our book. And uh, I have taken this out of the chapter by uh, Mosburner, who summarizes the genetic engineering in marine diatoms. So the, 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 the most uh, frequently used diatom species are certainly Thalassocera and Pheodactylum. Here are the transformation systems list, uh, listed. We use bio, uh, uh, biolistics. We can use conjugation and uh, electroporation uh, to introduce uh, foreign genes. Um, mutagenesis method, um, CRISPR-Cas with um, guide RNAs or um, the Nikase um, uh, can be used um, and the field started with talent. You need to do a lot of subcloning, you, um, um, you have diploid and sometimes tetraploid organisms, so it's not always the case that you get biallelic knockouts at the first round um, of subcloning. Uh, to be honest, I think this is never the case, so you need to do a lot of subcloning. Um, cell, um, cell line selections uh, usually works via antibiotics, uh, fluorescent proteins or drug-based um, selection can also be applied and then you, you need to apply mutagenesis screening. So uh, CRISPR Cas, just to um, give you a brief um, introduction um, uh, about um, uh, the uh, uh, biology of CRISPR Cas. Um, CRISPR-Cas is basically an adaptive immunity, so this is the schematic how it works. The bacterium, when a phage infects the bacterium, um, a spacer is being produced um, by the bacterium, and this is then becoming part of this array we find sometimes, not in all bacteria, but um, uh, many bacteria, and I showed one of these arrays um, before, in the bacterial genome, and once the infection takes place again, the bacterial can express these um, CRISPR RNAs and then the, uh, the, the phage is being eliminated because the guide is, um, is homologous to uh, the um, uh, phage um, uh, RNA. And uh, we have uh, developed uh, the CRISPR system for diatoms, as I said, um, um, and uh, what we usually uh, use is um, a U6 promoter, uh, which is very strong. Um, it drives expression of the guide. We have the single RNA scaffold um, and so on. Uh, what is really very important is the PAM sequence. It can be um, NGG. Uh, and um, if this PAM is not as specific matching, as accurately matching as possible, the guide RNA won't really work and therefore the efficiency of your knockout is really very much reduced. Um, in addition, of course, to the design of the guide RNA, which is also key in order to have very efficient um, gene knockouts and gene targeting. 
We in our lab used the golden, clay, a golden gate cloning system in order to assemble the constructs for CRISPR-Cas. Uh, it works very well uh, in, in our lab. We have a different selection of promoters, uh, UTRs, uh, signal peptides, um, open reading frames and terminators, and you have different levels, level 0, level 1, and level 2. The last level really uh, represents the uh, complete um, construct then to be uh, used for genetic transformation. And in my lab, we use uh, biolistics most of the time, but also um, RNPs. And this is how um, the uh, um, urease gene, so the, the CRISPR-Cas construct for the urease gene was assembled by uh, Amanda Hobbs for Thalassocyrus pseudonana. I don't want to show all the details, but again, we have level two um, um, uh, uh, components, and all these will be assembled to the final construct, which um, uh, in includes the Cas9 um, and the U6 promoter, um, and so on, and the guide RNA. And these are some results from the original paper um, on the efficiency and robustness of gene deletion uh, using CRISPR-Cas and the Golden Gate system. So what we usually do uh, uh, use is instead of one guide, we use two guides. Because when you use two guides, you can generate a very nice and clear deletion you can see on, on gels as well. Uh, here shown on the left hand side, there's this uh, bench shift um, essay basically, where you have the wild type and then you see if you delete this, you have a shift in your band and this gives some first very clear um, evidence that the, um, the um, gene knockout was successful. Here highlighted the pen sequences um, and um, uh, how the uh, corresponding bands look like. And sometimes if you either have mosaic colonies, which can happen as well, right? So you have a genetically uh, uh, um, transformed cell line with wild type, then you have two bands. This is shown here. But then if you have a clear um, subcolony, then you just see only, only one band, and this is the band with a cut out um, gene, okay? Um, and then what we also developed over the last couple of years is molecules recombination um, driven by CRISPR-Cas um, because it's the most elegant way, right? So you don't mess up the genome, you just replace um, your target gene with another gene. Um, but this method was also not uh, very much available in the, um, in the field of uh, marine algae and therefore we, uh, we worked on this to establish it and um, I'm sure a lot of you know how the system works where you have a donor plasmid and then you basically replace the Cas um, enzyme makes a cut here and you replace an endogenous gene and this is uh, just a SID gene or any, it can be any gene uh, with, uh, your, with your donor gene and in this case this is the, um, uh, this is the nut resistant gene. Uh, just as a proof of principle to see if the system works and how efficient it is. Um, and this gives you some uh, PCR results about the efficiency and we were very pleased when we saw this um, so here you have a letter and here you have about 21 cell lines we have generated with this um, approach and about 17 or 18 of, of them for two different genes, nitrate reductase and this is a psilocybin gene which is part of the um, cell wall um, of, uh, of Thalassocyrus pseudonana. About 17 out of 21 uh, proved to be positive in terms of homologous recombination which was very, very encouraging. And um, if we knock out the psilocybin gene, which is involved in making the cell walls, we also get a very interesting phenotype. Um, and the phenotype is that the develops, so a part of the cell wall is just enlarging. We don't know really what the mechanism is of this gene uh, yet, but we, as based on these data, we can say it must be involved somehow in the regulation of the size of the cell wall of these diatoms, which is a very fundamental trait if you think of carbon sequestration, food webs, and so on. And on the right-hand side, D and um, E and F, this is just um, some wild-type cells. Um, and uh, to be honest, if we look at the efficiency, I think um, uh, to do homologous recombination in Tipsulonana has, has an efficiency of up to 85%. And if you look at this, you are on par with Fuscomitrella and with um, nanochloropsis, right? So I think this is very encouraging for at least the diatom community or anyone who works, who wants to work with um, diatoms. Uh, French Aeopsis cylindros, um, as I said, this was um, published in 2020. We managed to transform this species, which is a psychrophile. Um, just here you see the expression of um, uh, uh, GFP, this is chlorophyll fluorescence. These are three cells. 
So we managed to um, get this done, which was also very challenging um, uh, over the years because it grows very slowly in the lab and there, was, there were no um, expression systems available for any polar eukaryotic um, organism. Mm. I skipped through that. And uh, you need to keep them on ice all the time. And this is what you see in the background here, some two plates. And we are currently trying to also establish this bacas for F. cylindros, but this is much more challenging, although we have some preliminary um, uh, data that, that, that could provide evidence that it works. With the Cas mutant, a faint band, um, uh, we see here, um, uh, so the Cas seems to be, it seems to be expressed um, uh, uh, here, um, uh, uh, very, very um, strongly expressed and the mutant shows uh, a faint band. So maybe there is hope we can also have CRISPR-Cas um, genome editing in a polar organism. Conclusion for part two, diatoms have become really um, some of the most advanced model organisms for marine, specifically marine algal bioengineering because of the tool development our community um, undertook over the last, I would say 10 to 15 years. So my last, the last part of my talk is really um, about helping you if, um, if you are interested in that. Um, so we um, developed a startup um, a company a couple of years back, which is called Omicron CR. You can Google us and then you find, um, you find our website and uh, you get more information about what we do. In a nutshell, we help you to design and produce and test guide RNAs. And um, there's funding available. And I would be happy to receive requests from you um, if you are interested to get help with uh, the design of guide RNAs to streamline your um, algal biotechnological approaches. And we can do this with any algal species and with any plant species because we work in vitro. We don't need to have your organisms. So we would be happy to help uh, you if you are interested uh, in uh, in being very effective in terms of generating um, uh, knockouts. Um, how does it work? Um, just send us about a short justification, not longer than one page, in terms of what you want to do. And um, maybe also based on what the current challenges are you are facing. And then we look at this, we talk with you, and then we see how we can help, if we can help you, and if how we can help you. Okay. And um, just to remind you, really the guide RNAs are key together with the PAM um, sequence for effective and efficient genome editing. So it's really important to put a lot of effort into designing these single guide RNAs. But what most people um, are not so much aware of is that there, are, there could be a lot of potential issues with designing these guide RNAs. And I bet a lot of you just go to a um, go to online um, uh, data banks and resources in, uh, uh, in order to get help for designing your guide RNAs. And then you use the output, you design your guide RNAs, and you try to knock out the genes in your organisms. Potential issues, because most of the Cas enzymes you are using, they come from an organism that is very well adapted at 37 degrees. But plants and algae, they don't grow, or rarely, at 37 degrees. So the activity of these enzymes is reduced under normal um, culture conditions, like 20 degrees or 15 degrees. Then the in silico designed guide RNAs quite often are not performing as expected. And maybe you have experienced this already. You need to, to design not only one guide, but maybe 10 guides in order to find, find the one that is really most effective. And then, of course, there are many more issues. I've just listed three here either inefficient or biased DNA repair, which could be mainly some organisms, mainly repaired by a homologous um, uh, recombination or uh, non-homologous enzyme. So um, this is addressing uh, how critical temperature can be for um, uh, optimal genome editing. And here we have the conventional Cas9 enzyme and uh, we tested how effective, um, just with our Omicron CR assay we developed over the years, we affected we, um, how effective this um, SP-Cas9 really is under different temperatures. And as predicted, very nice cutting efficiency. So this is an uncut 
um, control, very nice cutting efficiency at 37, 20 is also works well, but then there is a significant drop below 20. So if you cultivate any organisms lower than that, maybe you struggle to get efficient gene knockouts. There is another Cas enzyme available, this is Cas12a, that is because of these issues that has been developed um, to enhance activity at lower temperatures. And you see here by applying our assay, it cuts down to almost 4 degrees, but the band is very, very faint. So the efficiency is not really good. So this is addressing temperature issues, then addressing the issue that there is a discrepancy between in silico designed RNAs and then the biological outcome in vivo. And this is shown here, we tested with our assay, we tested three different guide RNAs and although all these guide RNAs have received very high scores, we used the Broad Institute algorithm at MIT, they have received very high scores for being a very efficient, only one can be used. So if you as a researcher, a postdoc or a PhD student um, go and design your guide RNAs, you see only one out of whatever number is really effective. And this costs money, this costs your time, and we can reduce both if you use our service, because that's the goal. We want to make the selection of guide RNAs as effective and as successful as possible. And this is um, some of our unpublished data where we compare the in silico predicted uh, on target score uh, from the Broad Institute with our in vitro testing uh, we developed over the years. On the, on the y axis, you see the in silico Broad Institute based target prediction. On the x axis, you see our data. And look at the correlation, there's basically no correlation. Okay? And this gives you a good idea um, that we can help with our service to make you work more successful. So in vitro testing basically is important for, for streamlining your genome editing. And this is, this is what we do. So we still use the in silico predictions, but we develop our own algorithm based on in vitro testing. And then hopefully this will help um, to design better guide RNAs and to make the workflow more efficient. And this is very, uh, very preliminary data. I've received the results only yesterday before I, um, uh, before I started to, to travel here from um, Andrew Toastland, uh, who does uh, the modeling and model development in my group. You see here a random forest analysis of predicted versus uh, measured um, uh, guide RNA efficiency scores. And this is all done on in vitro testing. Right? So we do, uh, um, we screen hundreds of uh, plasmids and see which guide RNAs really cut uh, very well. And those data will then be used in order to uh, develop these models. And so far um, uh, the models perform relatively well. But this is very early days. We will add many, many more results uh, to make the predictions more, more robust. And then we have a graphical user interface, which we are going to publish also very soon, where you basically add your target gene here, for instance, and your guide RNAs, and then you get an idea based on our in vitro testing, how efficient the guide RNAs is. Uh, you can also then add the temperature at which you want to run these experiments, depending on uh, the re requirements of, your, of the algal or plant species uh, you, you work with. And hopefully this will improve then um, uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of your, of your work and um, of your results. So the conclusion from the third and last part of my talk is that um, hopefully you have um, seen that Omicron CR can help to streamline uh, your algal but equally well plant genome editing uh, by developing new methods for more precise and efficient targeting um, of genomic loci and uh, we can target any loci. Um, and yeah, and we are happy to help with your work uh, check out um, our website uh, to get more insights of what we do and what we, what we can't do, for instance. And um, I would be very happy to receive inquiries uh, from you. So last but not least, I'd like uh, to thank those that really did the work. 
and uh, most of the um, uh, genetic um, methods I was talking about, they were really developed by her. Amanda Hopes, together with Nigel Belshaw, they also do uh, most of the um, uh, bioinformatics as well as um, in, uh, in uh, silico work in the lab. And then when it comes to identifying the um, algal microbiomes in the ocean, um, uh, this was done by Cara Martin and Katrin Schmidt, uh, together with Anthony Duncan. Um, and Andrew Toslin, and all of them are bioinformaticians uh, in my lab. My main international collaborators, if you, as you have seen on several slides, uh, is the Joint Genome Institute in the US, and this is Igor Grigoriev, who is leading the ALGAL uh, group um, at JGI, uh, Carrie uh, and Emily and Simon, they are leading the metagenomics group at JGI. And then, of course, I also collaborate with uh, Sashi Kuma, and um, in Germany I have a collaborator, and in China it's Neho Ye uh, on algal genomics. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. for instance, chlamydomonas, right? Uh, we don't see any toxicity effects. And we have tested that uh, not only for Thalassocyte sonana, but also for Veodactylum. In diatoms, they don't seem to have any effects. Uh, that's a very good question. So, um, uh, at least what I know, uh, most of the product development based on diatom strains is done with either Pheodactylum trigonulum or Thalassocyte absolutnana, and then of course Nanopleuropsis as well. And all three species have a very well sequenced genome. So this shouldn't be an issue. Um, and for other strains, you want to identi or you, you identify based on a screening uh, um, um, project or bioprospecting project where you go in the environment, isolate. Sequencing is not that big issue anymore, right? I mean, you have, if, if you sequencing, you can generate decent genome sequences in a relatively short amount of time and uh, for not much cost. So if you find an algal strain you think is really ideal for bioproduct development, um, I would suggest you invest some of your resources into sequencing it because then we could help basically with developing um, um, uh, genetically um, you know, tools in order to genetically modify your strain of interest. But yeah, I agree because the diversity is so high and um, uh, a lot more sequencing needs to be done in order to provide the genomes good assemblies uh, then that can be used uh, for those strains you want to use for product development. Um, and especially, as I said, uh, diatoms are the most diverse group of algae, so there is still a lot done. Uh, but in order to address that question, we have JGI granted us 100 diatom genomes project. Um, and there are a lot of algal initiatives uh, currently underway in order to get those fundamental, and you're completely right, fundamental and very important data. Because without a good knowledge about your genome, it's really difficult to do product development and also to look for the gene clusters of interest. Yeah? Uh, you know, it's always uh, difficult to imagine how speciation has occurred in seas because it is one continuum as compared to land where physical barriers come up, you know, very quickly. But I, what I want to ask you is, uh, is there a diatom species which is present from cold to warm? Because that will be most interesting to work on as a model uh, because the physical structure has not changed, but Basically, changes have come through metabolic changes, which may be interesting to study the genes which have changed their expression in adapting from 
warm to cold or from cold to warm. Mm. Uh, usually models are picked because it is easy to get their foreign DNA into. So the, the, uh, is the diatom community aware of this fact uh, is the model being picked on the basis of how easy it is to handle in the lab already? Um, so to address the first part of your question, so speciation in diatoms can occur on relatively short time scales. So we have seen this for a lot of species. Um, you have a lot of local adaptations. So you can have a species with, um, with uh, strains that are locally adapted uh, to uh, a specific environmental conditions a very good example that, that uh, comes up is the Baltic Sea, where you have salinity gradients, and we have species that are distributed all over the Baltic Sea. Uh, Scalotinema marinoi would be one example, but then if we look at the genomic diversity within this species, we find extreme significant differences. So there is a lot of local adaptation. Um, um, these are microbes, so if you compare them with plants, um, speciation takes place over shorter periods of time. So they diversify very, very quickly. And then you see local adaptation, and you see this on uh, the level of the genome, the level of the transcriptome, and even when you look at um, the physiological plasticity, and you were referring to this. So you will see differences within a species in terms of clades that are locally adapted when it comes to physiological characteristics, phenotypes and so on. So you really would need to, uh, um, I would not guess that there is one strain that occurs across all Latin, uh, latitudinal zones, with this in mind, all lati uh, latitudinal zones, uh, which, is, which is capable of dealing with all these environmental conditions. You have, you have subclades and they can, they can deal with specific environmental conditions, and we see this, and they can evolve over relatively short periods of time. I, you know, I, I talk about thousands of years, not millions of years. Um, but all this diversity is out there. It's being generated, as you say, in a fluid environment, where you would think the boundaries are fuzzy, but we know that there are boundaries. The boundaries are subtle, but yet they define species boundaries. And, 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 and one example is in the Southern Ocean. It's maybe the best example because the Southern Ocean has very strong uh, frontal zones separating the Antarctic continent from the rest of the globe. And if you look at these frontal zones, you see speciation taking place within one species complex according to the zonation of the surface ocean. Although this is all sort of mixed and you have a very dynamic ecosystem, yet there are these, there are these, um, these um, ecosystem boundaries that are invisible to our eye, which is very different to land ecosystems, uh, for sure. But they are there. It's just more difficult to identify them and how they influence the evolution of microbes in the ocean. It's very challenging. But to me, this is one of the most exciting areas. And then you can learn from sequencing their genomes how they have evolved and what they have acquired over time to be able to thrive under these different environmental conditions. And this can be exploited. And not many people so far do this. standard uh, CAS, and you work with yeast, and your question was about which 
Cas <laughs> enzyme is most appropriate for for what? E stem fungus. Both the organisms is grow, uh, uh, suitable temperature is 28 or 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, this really depends on at what kind of temperatures your your yeast strains grow. Or, yeah. Suppose it is 28 degrees centigrade. So which one? With 28, you can use the the the, the, um, the conventional Cas9. Okay. Streptomyces pyrogens Cas9, which works pretty well at 28. It also works at 20. But as soon as you go below 20, I would suggest to use CPF1. Thank you. Yeah, then yeah, the cutting is more effective. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Mook. That was it, like me, <laughs> about the different gas mines and yes, the temperatures that they work on. And I really hope that people can uh, benefit from the microns here. Now, I request Dr. Pavan Mulokha to please uh, present the moment to Dr. Pavan. by prospecting about the diatoms and he has been traveling to like where we get frozen <laughs> we cannot even dream to go there but he has been exploring all the way so <laughs> so I met uh, uh, Professor Thomas in uh, Northeast uh, when we were invited for some brainstorm meeting in, uh, and arranged by DST in Bayariti Kowati so since then we have been in contact and uh, uh, talking each other with the research and doing the collaboration. So thanks uh, Thomas for coming. He, he, he was not getting visa, but at the last moment he made it. I'm happy to see him. So our next uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Ananda Bandhapadhyay, where uh, I met him in uh, when I was in USD and he was joined as a postdoc in uh, UC Berkeley, so and the building was the same. So we used to interact as Indians and uh, have many meetings there. So uh, so currently he is uh, working as a vice president uh, in Reliance Industries. He his major focus in uh, to develop biofuel from algae and value added product from other microbes. Previously, he has been a group leader of the genome editing program at Syngenta. Also, he has been recruited as international scientist at Erie, Philippines. So, uh, Dr. Anand uh, uh, completed his PhD from Erie, Philippines, followed by his postdoc at UC Berkeley. And his major interest to apply uh, CRISPR uh, technology for various industrial applications. Let's see how industry people can reveal their uh, data to the public. Welcome, and <laughs> there. So good afternoon all and uh, thank you Sashi for in, uh, uh, inviting me here. 
and thank you to ICGB and organizing committee. So I had a chat with Shashi before uh, developing this one and I told Shashi I was in public sector and recently moved to uh, private. So what, what, you are, what is your expectation? So he told me, uh, you basically talk about CRISPR, its application. There will be a lot of students and uh, early career scientists, etc. And uh, as much as you can talk about your uh, uh, efforts in the area of uh, uh, algae and uh, industrial biotech. So uh, also I thank Dr. Thomas for making nice in introduction of CRISPR. So that helps me a lot. So I have divided my talk in these uh, five, uh, sorry there is a mistake. So, so initial discovery and excitement, I will go very fast on all these and some of the basics, I kept some of the slides. And uh, technology, this technology is progressing like very fast, with different modifications and com coming up every day, uh, every other week I would say. And uh, in the industry, in various kind of industry and biotechnological application, uh, uh, this technology is doing something or bringing some kind of opportunity which was considered not possible even uh, 10 years back, something like that. So, a uh, lot of excitement. So, just to catch that, uh, before going to that, uh, I am coming from Reliance Industries and uh, uh, you all know there are majorly three areas Reliance work. One is uh, telecommunication, one is petroleum and retail. So I come from the petroleum section, Reliance Industries Limited and uh, we do many things related to alternative fuels and green chemicals. So. Uh, uh, I am uh, leading the biotech R&D of uh, that alternative fuel and green chemicals. And uh, this is our uh, laboratories uh, in Bombay. This is the algae plant in uh, Gujarat and it is one of the biggest algae plant of the globe. And uh, this is our lab, one of the labs. So just with this disco uh, 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 brief introduction and going to the main topic. So discovery and excitement, we all know uh, this last year's Nobel came uh, uh, to the CRISPR field and uh, Jennifer Dodna and Charpentier, they basically got this. So CRISPR was in the market since long back, just modifying gRNA and making it uh, uh, as per your uh, will. So that particular invention uh, brought a lot of excitement in the field and uh, eventually Nobel uh, was given last year. So what is the basic change uh, due to this CRISPR? Previously, uh, we, can, we could do transformation, but whatever change we do, it was random. So anywhere it can go, it's very difficult to control. Uh, you have to select a lot. But in case of CRISPR-Cas9 system, you can just target one particular area of genome and you can change that. And in the following modifications of CRISPR-Cas9 system, you can even change one single nucleotide. So single nucleotide polymorphism we know brings a lot of new traits. So just changing one nucleotide, you can bring a uh, certain kind of traits of uh, your interest. So targeted change is possible and uh, it's a very, uh, since identification of this as a genome editing tool, uh, craze started we could see funding started pouring in, lot of funding from 2012 to 2013 on this field and uh, uh, many uh, other like talon, meganuclear, zinc finger nucleus, etc. were there in the field for a few years but CRISPR shoot up uh, rapidly. Uh, investment started pouring in in government and in private sector as well and uh, patents. So, US is the number one and then China, they are basically uh, going very far with respect to patent uh, and with respect to other countries. So, a lot of things started coming in and we saw uh, that Bloomberg is predicting it's almost a $7 billion market by 2025-26. So, there are majorly two hub of CRISPR uh, 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 discovery. So one was uh, Broad Institute, MIT, Feng, Chang and team. They have developed few things and uh, Barclay, Jennifer Duorna and Charpentier, uh, they also developed the initial uh, uh, 
CRISPR discovery that it can be used as a genome editing tool for prokaryotes, but many uh, eukaryotic applications was shown by uh, Broad Institute Feng Zhang and they had certain conflict, patent conflict probably a lot of people knows, uh, a lot of people know about that. But one thing is very interesting, even if this early CRISPR Cas9 patent is not uh, well uh, defined, a lot of litigations are going on across the courts, US courts, but you can see many companies and very big companies are Virgin, Cigna, Aldridge, Novartis, Dow, uh, ERS, Bayer, they all have sub-licensed it uh, from these two owners and gradually these uh, companies like in the plant field, uh, Bayer is the company who holds the whole pool of the CRISPR patent and they are providing it to the downstream companies and it's everywhere. So it looks like it's becoming like a PCR technology when it came a lot of things happened then gradually it, people started using it so much that it became kind of uh, open, uh, 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 protections become very less. So uh, we are hoping that also for CRISPR, uh, uh, considering all these things. Now, Dr. Thomas introduced what is CRISPR. I am not repeating it. I will just tell one important aspect that Danisco is a company in early days who are known for yogurt and cheese making. Uh, they are the one who basically started using a thermophila strain, choose it swift. Uh, for its pizza making and uh, cheese making uh, pizza, uh, cheese making uh, 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 kind of uh, products. Later on, it was found the strains they were selecting, they, they are basically fudge resistance. And gradually, people started to know why they are fudge resistant because they have CRISPR errors. And then further modification came up. So, whoever has eaten a yogurt from a shelf of any uh, uh, shopping mall, we all have eaten plenty of crispers already last 20 years. So uh, consumption, uh, so I like to tell this, like last 20 years uh, we are eating crisper uh, without any uh, uh, issue, but we, get, we got to know that recently. But anyway, so from here if you see there are basically two classes of crisper uh, in the field. So class 1 and class 2. So class 1 has many nucleases together. So CRISPR is simple, one gRNA and one protein. So the class 1 proteins are uh, with subunits and multi multiple protein system. But whereas class 2s are basically single protein systems. So Cas9 and CPF1. So mostly people are working uh, in this area because it's easy to handle. Although some activities are going on here, but it's much easy to handle in class 2. So CRISPR-Cas9 and CRISPR-CPF1 most commonly use two CRISPR systems, both are from the cluster. So what it does, it's very simple, uh, one Cas9, one gRNA, you hook them together, gRNA will take the Cas9 to a particular site, you can choose this site by designing this gRNA and then Cas9 will cut, there will be double cell break and cell will repair it, while repairing it, it will generate mutations. And if you use multiple gRNAs, then you can target multiple genes in one shot. So uh, multiplexing can be done very easily. And also you can, sub you can supply an outside, uh, uh, outside gene with or a portion of gene with homology arm. It can do homology directed repair and it's allele swapping, these kind of things are coming up. So interesting thing, I just kept, this is very basic, but I just kept this one like Mutational breeding in case of plant field, it's similar to our SDN1, like simple cut, repair, cell repairs and uh, there is a mismatch. Some portion uh, swapping is possible, its breeding equivalent is like uh, 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 marker assisted back cross breeding type of uh, 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 trait you can develop. So many such traits which I have enlisted here can be done by CRISPR-Cas9 in a much faster way. So these are the why I kept these two, these are two basics, but these are the two CRISPR system recently in India have been identified as will not come under GMO regulations. So uh, Dr. Pentel is here, he will be able to probably describe better, 
but it's very hopeful uh, situation for uh, people in India and we are in the algae industry or uh, industrial people we are also looking forward to it if plant system SDN1 and SDN2 is considered as non-GM then definitely similar thing might come up for our uh, organism as well and the third type is SDN3 which is like a big gene uh, uh, swapping and this is just like GMO so I'm uh, uh, this is not allowed in India, this is still GMO as you can understand, but one and two uh, Indian government has done something else. Now multiple modifications are coming up, but it can do many things. It's a simple protein and gRNA complex. So epigenetic modifications you can do by attaching epigenetic regulators along with the Cas9 protein and then uh, Transcriptional activation or transcriptional modulation can also be done by attaching activator or modulator along with this Cas9 protein. So, uh, in nutshell, it, it brings lot of uh, uh, different possibilities for molecular activities like gene repression, gene activation, tagging, purification, image, imaging genomic loci, genome-wide screening, you can do single cut in one of the strands, you can do knee, knee case is available, modified Cas9 and then gene knockout as we all were talking. So CRISPR in nutshell gives, it's a simple tool, cheap but it can do many things in molecular world. So immediately different kind of progress started happening. So one of the important one which I was talking about, uh, base editing. So. Uh, CBE, ABE and ADAR, three type of uh, base editing variants came up where uh, the base editors were attached with the Cas9 itself and you can do single uh, nucleotide change. So uh, single nucleotide polymorphism uh, uh, was, uh, can be changed by this technology. Similarly CRISPR-X came up where uh, people use MS2 trap system, uh, it, they hook this MS2 trap with the gRNA. So you can do multiple base editing in a tunable window in one shot. So CRISPR-X, uh, many industries are using it. I personally know uh, from my previous experience. Similarly, CRISPR and Retron, uh, especially for the plant community, what happens uh, integration or transformation is little bit difficult. You cannot just micro inject and do it. Lot of complexity, cell wall is there, etc., etc. So this crispy Retron, is becoming gradually becoming very popular where retrons are natural DNA elements coding for a reverse transcriptase as well as a template on which the RT acts to create multi-copy single-stranded DNA product. So you just hook this retron with gRNA and gRNA will go, it will take the protein to cut but gRNA will carry retron in it and inside of the retron you put your gene of interest. So that will be reverse transcribed there and got in. So this crispy retron technology is becoming very popular these days. Similarly, evolve R system, instead you give a cut by CRISPR Cas9, but instead of waiting long for a plant to repair that, you just attach one uh, uh, polymerase, which is basically error prone polymerase. So CRISPR Cas9 enzyme will go on cutting different places and these polymerase will go on repairing those places and it will create a lot of mutations while doing it. So many such variations came up, virgin mediated ones are also there, I am not going in very much detail and also uh, this one uh, DNA transposon uh, attached CRISPRs are also there uh, and uh, prime editing came up recently which is now uh, quite popular instead of gRNA you uh, you put PEG RNAs where in the PEG RNA you have your edit templates you have RT it's a modified kind of retron where you uh, put everything in one gRNA and your gene of interest etc definitely size uh, problem is there you cannot put bigger like a pickle allele or something like that so uh, but this is also very uh, good for uh, precise mutations and small indels. And the last modification I would talk about, this is in the bioinformatics field, 
and mostly happened in the uh, animal or human field where algorithms are there who can predict after DNA cut what kind of repair cell will do. So this is awesome but it's not present in uh, this algorithm doesn't work for plant or uh, algae yet hopefully it will come up. So one forecast sprout or in Delphi these softwares are used where uh, you design an experiment, you design a gRNA, you know where that gRNA will cut. But after cutting, what kind of repair cell will do? It can tell you, it can predict. So this was developed by uh, accumulating like thousands of data related to uh, this editing in human cell lines, different human cell lines, and then this algorithm was made. So more modifications are coming up in these areas. So I'm not uh, going in detail on those. So delivery is still a problem, uh, especially for plant and algae, we face this. Uh, now the uh, agrobacterium or biolistic still in the algae field, biolistic is the one uh, working little better with respect to other tools. And for plant, uh, everything uh, works well. But still there are uh, certain uh, 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 problems uh, which has been seen. Some of these uh, rec uh, recalcitrant lines, especially we can transform rice like anything. So many protocols are there, but some of the recalcitrant rice lines, which are elite lines, is very difficult to transform. So these kind of problems, uh, people are uh, uh, using nanomaterial, where nanomaterial carrying DNA and gRNA and it is getting in uh, in a passive way and it can transfer uh, so these kind of uh, areas people are working whereas it is easier in case of human cell lines injecting is possible and uh, many applications so this tool uh, got many applications in the area of therapeutics biological research ag biotech industrial biotech etc so i am not going in detail uh, just briefly uh, Different cancer model, cancer therapies, immuno T cell therapies, human trial in China on some PD-1 gene related to cancer is already going on. Uh, in vitro gametogenesis, gene knockout to uh, stop miscarriage uh, in Francis Crick Institute, these are in pipeline. Sickle cell disease, some of these genetic disease can be uh, which, uh, where the cause of disease is the mismatch or in Dales or whatever can be rectified. Similarly, infectious disease, Kobe University, Japan, removed regulatory genes and stopped HIV CCR5 mutation. So we all know this story, this Chinese guy who took two patients, both are uh, HIV positive and uh, he did a CCR5 mutation in uh, uh, embryo and the, and the offspring produced is uh, HIV uh, free. So, uh, but he was in jail, recently released in China because he didn't took any permissions and did it. So a lot of things are happening here and also organ transplantation and uh, e-genesis, xenotransplantation field, uh, many uh, things are happening. Drug discovery, if we see in uh, life from target identification to downstream clinical trials, uh, each and every steps are happening having one or two applications of this tool and technology. So interesting, we have uh, developed one uh, kit. During this COVID time, we had uh, uh, very little to do. Uh, we could not go outside, our travel was, uh, so we developed a CRISPR-based CRISPR uh, uh, tool and we also published where very rapidly you can do uh, 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 diagnosis of uh, uh, any viral uh, particle. So, in the livestock field, these Dalmatians are known for kidney stones. Single gene modification by CRISPR-Cas9, this can be rectified. Companies are doing it. Faster horse bread, there are companies which, uh, 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 Argentinian company which came up with this breed, still not approved. Healthier fish, salmon, we know, a uh, lot of work is happening there and dehorning of the cow by again single gene knockout. Uh, people are uh, getting dehorned cow because it's a big problem. They fight each other, they kill each other, so etc. 
And in case of plant, uh, we see uh, this non-browning mushroom from uh, Penn State came uh, early and uh, it has gone through uh, a regulatory and uh, it's it very near to market. Uh, Hoff Free Beer, uh, it's, it's a big project. The previous company I used to work, uh, we used to have this project where hoffs are uh, very difficult to grow and it requires a lot of water. So you can just change one gene in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and you can create that hoff like flavor in the beer. So a lot of beer companies used to fund us for that activities. Spicy tomato, decaffeinated coffee, waxy corn, gluten free wheat, etc. So I just kept these four or five slides uh, just to uh, uh, give an overview like how this CRISPR is basically bringing opportunities to different field and different industries uh, be it pharma, be it uh, uh, livestock field, be it agriculture, etc. Now, okay. Sorry. Now in industrial biotech, uh, what we do, uh, many companies are doing it, is, it is very important and a petroleum company, a big company like us, we also know that fossil fuel is limited and we cannot exploit that throughout uh, like many many years, it's, it's limited resource. Number two, globally uh, cutting down uh, CO2 emission, methane emission is very important and uh, what uh, we, we also want to produce all these petroleum related chemicals we tell pet chems, be it tire producing chemicals, be it MEG, be it styrene, etc. that uh, we could produce in bacterial route or we could produce through algae uh, by applying certain kind of technologies. But the problem is pathway or flux towards one particular chemical, modifying that flux and basically stopping the competitive flux is very difficult with existing technologies. RNAi and other traditional uh, genome, uh, genome modification technologies are not enough. So since uh, this CRISPR technology came up in the market, we started feeling interested. Organism selection, we have selected organism, we know what kind of organism we need. Then organism development, that part, then process, then scale up. This organism development part is very important where we basically, sorry, uh, basically do genome editing and uh, two type, either a CRISPR mediated uh, 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 just knockout or CRISPR mediated modulation of expression uh, so that uh, uh, we can test the engineer's strain and we can develop engineer's strain and that engineer's strain has perfect flux for one particular chemical and that then goes for scale up. So uh, many such chemicals, these are all well known, these chemicals already are produced in bacteria and uh, uh, so now comes to the photosynthetic uh, organism algae. So what we do in algae? So we know bio, bio refinery by multi omics different kind of things could be produced like biochemicals, biofuel, lipid, biogas, etc. But definitely there are some drawbacks in microalgae. So some of the robust strengths because end of the day either we have to grow in reactors. Now if we grow algae in reactors cost shoot up and there are different type of engineering issues with reactors. So we want to put them in a large pond and we want to grow them there and gradually that uh, uh, has to face all kind of weather, right? Pond cannot be covered, like we are talking about 2000 uh, square meter ponds, multiple 2000 square meter ponds. So uh, we need to have a robust strain. So far, the robust strains are known in the field or known with us as well are very difficult to transform. So like chlamydomonas or diatoms or other where you can transform. But some of the nanochloroxys which are considered as one of the very popular robust strain for industrial development, uh, it's very difficult to transform CRISPR-Cas9 or CPF1, toxicity and different other uh, problem comes. 
which we want to solve. And uh, different small molecules we want to produce like cosmetic precursors. So uh, I will show this picture then this will help better. So this is the pond uh, we operate. So these are small ponds and these are multi, multiple big ponds. And this is little old picture. Here we also have like tw tw uh, uh, much bigger ponds as I was talking about. Now all these get controlled from here. These are like what kind of uh, uh, flow rate is needed, what kind of, uh, 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 what kind of nutrients needs to be given. Water, we bring water from sea, uh, from Gujarat coast and we filter it and then we put it there. So to try to grow and then uh, it go, go to separation, extraction and then it goes to uh, hydrothermal liquefaction. This is uh, we call RCAT HDL, Reliance has a, uh, uh, a proprietary catalyst. By hydrothermal liquefaction we develop uh, oil, uh, bio crude from it and remnant rest of the part we take for different other formulations. And here also we go some part with biorefinery where we do uh, basically try to produce different kind of value added chemicals uh, like uh, 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 spider silk or uh, like uh, some other uh, related value added chemicals. So sometime I try to <laughs> remember few things and then I remember I am not supposed to talk. But anyway, so uh, different kind of uh, chemicals also go in that route. So precursors are for cosmetic industry, uh, pet chem as I was mentioning MEG, MEG is very very uh, well known petroleum related chemicals which is uh, widely used in tires and other kind of so those kind of things also we try to produce from algae. And what are this, what are the uh, major areas, there are major three areas we concentrate on algae editing and towards editing. This is uh, photosynthetic efficiency and biomass production. This picture comes very near to that so I put it from a review, very recent review. So. Uh, where uh, carbon concentrating mechanism there are a few genes ci a4 5 those who are working in this field they all know so uh, we are doing this uh, over expressing knocking down so that comes carbon concentration happens more then kelvin manipulating kelvin cycle enzymes there are few genes known here so we are also targeting those ps2 d1 protein engineering is also something we are uh, uh, observing and optimizing light harvesting through reduction of antenna size. So this worked very well, many publications came, even nature publication came, we did, it worked extremely well in uh, laboratory in our hand. When we put that in multi acre ponds, we see no difference. So there are certain, certain issues like when you take it to scale, some of these very novel uh, genetic manipulation and, and its benefits don't get reflected uh, in the field or in the bigger pond. So this is very well uh, characterized and discussed uh, uh, modification. But I also talked with some other algae company in US. Uh, this is the same issue we see in some of these. So second, in case of value added product, so definitely you can understand it, efficient promoters and enhancer elements are very important and very key. Uh, so uh, and then pathway construction and then pathway regulation strategies. So as I was mentioning that you have to shut down some of the competing genes and you have to basically induce that flask which will lead to your target product. So this one uh, we are uh, doing, uh, we are designing in, uh, in Chlamydomonas, we check it in Chlamydomonas, then try to put it in our industrial strain. So how it works there. Also we are side by side keeping bacteria. So uh, uh, so then uh, in case of lipid, so majorly three value added product, enhancement of lipid, photo photosynthesis enhancement. These are the three major area. Uh, all people are working across the globe, those who are in this field, uh, so that uh, more lipid could be produced, more oil could be extracted, 
and value-added product could be generated from algal uh, uh, system. So these are the areas we work and uh, I am not going in detail of time is not there. So detail of each and every gene we worked so far and again the basic uh, transformation is still CRISPR-Cas9 mediated transformation for algae is still biolistic. We want to move out from that because a lot of issues are there and uh, also we need much smaller uh, nucleases. So there is a company in Netherlands, uh, Hudson River Biotechnology. They have come up with a smaller uh, nucleus uh, and they are doing nanomaterial mediated uh, transfer of their target, uh, uh, target CRISPR tools. So we are also collaborating with them and we are trying to basically solve these problems of uh, toxicity, number one, size, number two, and third, uh, the cargo delivery. So this is how we are uh, working in the area of uh, algae. This is some of the published papers, I'm not going in that. I talked about patent conflicts, this group from Berkeley and uh, Broad, it's still not solved. And the last slide, uh, last but one, ethics. So I was talking about this scientist, the Chinese scientist, who basically CCR5, knocked out CCR5 gene in embryo and uh, uh, went in jail. What what was seen for his case, everything was fine. The kid is fine, kid is very nice, doing everything well, but the brain is little enlarged. Nobody knows whether the CRISPR knockout is the reason or anything else is the reason, but uh, it's still too early to do embryonic change in human by CRISPR. This is, uh, and I, last two years I was in China, uh, this is becoming a very, very, uh, like a craze, like making these small pins so that you can take it in your handbag. So rich Chinese women, they like small handbag and a small pig in the handbag as a pet. So there is a company which is making it by genome editing. And initially it started coming out in the market and uh, then government stopped it. So why it is needed, like why you are going to generate a completely <laughs> different uh, animal out of uh, animal anyway. So definitely biohazards etc. these are the areas we have to be careful. And for industry which I see uh, these are the major steps where this toolbox for CRISPR different kind of protein Cas9, Cas12, Cas13, 14, Cas8 I was talking about, Cas Y. This will come up globally, different lab, different uh, uh, organizations, private public, they are doing. CRISPR is gradually becoming engineering platform for the industry. It is also true for bacteria and downstream fermentation based companies as well as companies like us while we are using algae. Similarly, there are issues. What are the major issues in this field? Delivery issues for human application, immune response, molecular precision, editing efficiency still very, very like uh, diverse in different species, manufacturing and then delivery system uh, engineering, this is also I mentioned that delivery is still a problem and uh, so once you make your toolbox for protein engineering and you develop this kind of modifications, then AI and data mining, uh, something uh, it's happening in this field but not as expected as other and finally developing manufacturing and infrastructure. So it requires specific type of infrastructure which is very much uh, 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 investment intensive. So, so that's also one bottleneck we are trying to pass through. So that's it from my side, more like a general uh, popular talk. And uh, this is our laboratories in Mumbai and this is our team. So thank you very much. Any question? Yes.
this part, the second question, let me answer. First question is too specific. Uh, we can discuss later on that. The second question I'd like to answer this metabolic pathway. There are many companies in bacterial uh, product, ba product development through bacteria. And there are even very successful companies in US for Lanza Tech who are producing uh, pet cans through bacterial uh, chassis. So now uh, there are algorithms already established for different meta metabolic pathways related to bacteria where you can just try to see those, manipulate those little bit and you can find out optimal uh, knockout or knockdown or modulation of certain genes to produce a pathway without any or least side effects. So these algorithms are available. We are taking those algorithms and we are trying to put it in algae. We also work in bacteria, but that's why we are in touch with these companies. So we try to put it in algae and then gradually we try to see if that same thing we can mimic in algae or not. So that our uh, uh, regulation, uh, sorry, uh, one pathway or one flux happens in a way we expect, but without interfering other, uh, like thousands of different other uh, related reactions are happening within a cell. So without disturbing those. So uh, these algorithms are available. You can, if you want, I can give you some examples. No, 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 no. I am. I, I talked about nucleus, the enzyme CRISPR Cas9. Cas9 is a nucleus. So that enzyme is quite bigger with respect to uh, some of the algal strain which are widely used for uh, industrial purpose and they have toxicity effects. So these two smaller size and less toxic are very important for algae component. It's not so uh, like CRISPR Cas9, CRISPR CPF1 people widely use in plant right so all kind of plants it works either either or uh, you can use but in case of algae there are certain like chlamydomonas and others they work well but most of the industrial strain we see size is a problem and toxicity is a problem yeah definitely so there are two ways to do it one make that particular strain uh, uh, acclimatized with the environment by changing some kind of genes. So like trial and error, many companies have done and gradually came up with a robust strain. That robust strain helps grows well during the rainy season, grows well during uh, cold climate it, and normal uh, hot weather, it works well. So uh, that kind of things people have done. But now there are ways, there are genes people are modifying, manipulating and putting in pond and trying to see that uh, if that gives more uh, suitability for multi-weather growth. So now the, there is a, still there is a problem in India on that. So once we put that, it becomes in today's, this, uh, up to like it becomes GMO, right? And even if, uh, and then you have to cover your pond with uh, a shade or something. So you have to make it like a greenhouse pond within greenhouse. So that exactly doesn't give you the external weather thing, but you can mimic as much as possible and see those kind of things. This happens and many genes, uh, in that picture there were a few genes where lipid and there were ways uh, of uh, different, there are different aspects and genes related to that aspects are very well known these days. So we try to knock out or overexpress those genes in algae to produce more lipid inside of the cell. Yes. Being a scientist, I should not comment like this, but many scientists say like what grows in plastic plate that doesn't happen inside of your body. So <laughs> it's a common, uh, some like to some extent we can really mimic that external weather in the lab, but 
there are many uh, other factors which we cannot mimic inside of the lab, uh, uh, which basically one of the reasons uh, it fails. Like uh, doctor will know that there are many genes like DREB1, DREB2 and many other drought responsive genes made havoc in publications. But at ED, I saw field trials and it's not up to that height. So, but they are published in nature, they are published in science, uh, Japanese scientists, they have done it. But uh, it happens and uh, so my answer was, it's pretty general because I don't know either, but <laughs> I can predict only that there might be some other factors or even some of the uh, like transcription factors which are uh, which need certain kind of cue to switch on that might not happen in lab. So you never know. Yeah. Okay. Which product? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, which product do you have in the market now? From uh, from Al Al Algae, yeah. Algae, no, nothing. We don't have anything in market. We took six to seven years uh, to develop biofuel. We can develop biofuel uh, very well from algae, but it is still 120 to 150 barrel a dollar a barrel. Whereas petrol product, fossil petrol product, goes from 40 dollar to 100 dollar barrel. It fluctuates. So when it comes to near 100, uh, management says, okay, let's put more investment in algae. When the petrol price goes down to 40. Then management says, oh, don't put algae is far away. So that happens to, it's not in market, but we can develop it. And we are talking to ExxonMobil at this point of time to take it in a much bigger uh, proportion and do it. Second, carbon credit is very important in Europe and other places. It's still not that much happening in India so far. So if, uh, even if in the petrol, if you add little bit of biofuel, 1%, 2%, you get a lot of credit or tax exemption from government. So that kind of things are, we have heard that is also coming in India as well, then definitely this biofuel research or alternative fuel research will get, get boost. So uh, bringing in market POC, large scale, both are successful. But still bringing in market requires many other aspects of non-scientific aspects involving it. Regulation to uh, finance, to supply chain, to many things. So to invest that kind of investment, uh, probably the regulatory scenario needs to be more clear, etc. So uh, that's where there is a pause. And we are very much for the green chemicals these days and as I was mentioning styrene, MEG, these are very important products. Some of the acids, those are very important products come as a byproduct in the uh, petroleum uh, refineries. So we are trying to develop those in algae and as well as bacteria. And we have successfully done few uh, but still in the scaling up stage, not in the market. So are you related to the government? Your company is the governmental company? No, no, private company. So then after seven years, no product in the market, is it? Uh, like what is going to be happen in the future? It's, it's, a very big, it's a very big company and uh, they probably making enough money from different other field. Okay. So they are okay to keep few scientists doing something crazy. They are okay to invest that amount. So okay. we also sometimes feel, we also feel that why they are putting so much money for so many years. But it's a long term vision that uh, one day fossil fuel will be an issue. Also carbon dioxide reduction everywhere people are talking and some benefits will come up. Uh, if you can uh, produce a pathway where carbon dioxide is assimilated, not uh, like uh, sent out to the environment, then as you know algae what it does it takes carbon dioxide sunlight and if you manipulate a little bit more gene it can produce very important commodities for you and then you uh, fix lot of carbon dioxide in the whole process and you get carbon credit so this green chemical concept is becoming it's little late in india but it's coming up very fast so 
hoping for the future, they are putting this R&D going for the last many years. Okay, thank you. How about the natural pigments? Are you also working on like beta carotene or astaxanthine? Yes. You are also working on these yeah, companies? Yeah, companies. Another one, some of the algae proteins are ready. Some of the companies want to take those. So we are discussing with them. One more product I could mention like artificial hemoglobin type of product which will give you like all these uh, meat, uh, plant based meat. So impossible foods and other we are also talking to them. So they are also interested to take algae protein for their product. And uh, uh, so one kind of hemoglobin like product we made which if you mix with this plant patty it gives you true meat type of color and taste. So that's also, but the final product will come from somebody else. We are producing only precursors or mm -hmm. it's like initial chemicals. Okay. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello sir, uh, first of all, this is very informative presentation you, you delivered here. I have basically two questions because uh, I am uh, from bioprocess engineering background and presently I am learning this CRISPR technique for the production of algae. So my question is related to uh, algae, if uh, we are selecting a thermophilic algae, means it is having the higher temperature, higher optimal temperature, so how this technique can be used for the manipulation of gene? And when a uh, second question is relevant to ethics, because uh, uh, have you ever heard the term of gene doping? Uh, if gene doping is there, means uh, like in sports, so a uh, person become a superhuman or something. So ethics should be there. So I just want second to Second question is uh, like quite well discussed last 20 years with GM crops. And Dr. Pendal is there, he knows, probably he faced this question thousand times. So <laughs> I don't think it's very relevant for algae field. It's very nascent field and completely non-food kind of products we are talking about mostly and we are going for general chemicals. And these chemicals are normally producing by catalytic cracking of uh, bio crudes and uh, that has many gas emissions which is bad for environment. So we are avoiding all these by doing a green way of making these products. So I believe a little bit changing of some of the genes in a non-transient way. So we always have to mention this in algae like SDN1 and SDN2 would create much issue. And I also don't see much ethics uh, related to it because nature is doing this kind of mutations since its birth. So uh, even if you keep one rice line and you sequence it today and you sequence it after one year, you will see some changes there. So uh, uh, I don't see this generating some simple mutations for regulating certain kind of processes is a big ethical issue here scientifically. And I forgot your first question. It was uh, high temperature, right? Uh, so so for genome editing, uh, as Dr. Thomas was mentioning, 37, all these bacteria from where we are extracting these nucleases, Cas9, CPF, CPF1 little, what's little work, but Cas9, all these are 37, 38, so that temperature is, in India it goes up to 40. If you talk about, uh, if you talk about uh, uh, Indian summer, 40, uh, an open, open pond, then 40, 45 it goes and still these enzymes works. So high temperature variance apply uh, it will be easier for applying CRISPR Cas9 with respect to the ones which require much lower temperature to grow. presentation by you and I have just little question that, uh, recently I have just seen Instagram uh, videos and you have launched that you are coming up with some biofuel product 
So, uh, just I want to know that uh, which you have mentioned in your presentation that uh, you can uh, optimize your strain for different temperatures. So, suppose in India uh, we are facing 5 degree, 40 degree, 45 degree sometimes. So, you are having or you have developed the strain which are which can grow at lower degree at uh, and also at higher degree temperature. Temperature of one strain or you have different strain? No, we have two particular strains, industrial strain. We put them in this field which I show, the plant is in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. So in winter it goes quite down, but it goes 45 up to 50 in the summer mm -hmm. temperature. Okay. But it happily grows. Okay. okay. And there is some subtle change we do, it happily grows. And we found them after many years of uh, thing. But the problem, the most problem in this is uh, water actually. So when you extract algae from this whole slurry kind of stuff, you have to go through a lot of filtrations. Water removal from algal system is very, very uh, resource intensive and it takes your cost very high. So it doesn't remain uh, business feasible until and unless you discover some kind of by engineering some kind of filtration system where dewatering becomes very easy. So during harvesting this dewatering gives uh, and this filtration systems. Now if you talk about 20 acre, uh, uh, like 20,000 square meter ponds, like 100 ponds like that, then you are talking about big filtration units. Like it will be like whole ICG V1 filtration unit. So this kind of things are very costly and it doesn't keep that whole system uh, 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 business feasible anymore. So that's where we are trying and then the extraction process where we use hydrothermal liquefaction plus we are trying to come up with some new technology there as well where extracting bio crude would be cheaper. So I see these are the two major problems at present for algal and definitely uh, so far whatever we do in pond these are all non-GMOs or non-edited. Okay. So, up to certain level you can do these manipulations by changing nutrients, by changing environment, etc, etc. But the challenge is now to bring the GMOs there and we believe we can do much better. And the next we see little less challenging is genome edited ones where we get cellular engineering in a very high scale but put them in water and uh, in open pond and see how they go. Thank you, sir. Is seawater uh, based? Uh, yes, yes. So we water. bring uh, seawater by pipe and then we filter them in front of our plant and then we take that water in. One and of the things may, which could happen in open systems is contaminants. Yeah, con contaminants, grazers and uh, different kind of uh, arthropods and like all kind of biotic stresses are there and each of these stresses has some kind of remedies so and also strain plays a role some of the strains are prone to that some of the strains are not so all these initial setup took like many years for us to standardize yeah it's a big problem actually bacteria grazers and uh, many other biotic components in open system. I think, I think, I, I got it. So, but end of the day for bacterial product, yeast, etc., you have to go through fermentation. That also costs quite a bit. For us, we go for hydrothermal liquefaction. This is our own uh, proprietary ARCAT HDL uh, technology, which we use for a long time and in an Indi Indianized way, which gives us much cheaper uh, proposition. So that, that one part we see. Competition is not with bacteria field or Saccharomyces cerevisiae field. No, competition is there. That is with ourselves, our chemical people. First of all, all chemical engineers, they don't care biologists much and they think this bio process, this is very slow, it takes time, 
uh, any POC takes five years, seven years, something like that, where they bring up new chemistry within a year. So our competition is with them. So these fields are different way we can really be competitive with bacteria industry or with uh, the yeast industry. But competing with chemical uh, process of manufacturing all this is very well established since long back and they are very fast. So our competition is with them but carbon credit is with us. That is what all this speech I do to get our uh, funding done. <laughs> yes. There are ways of doing auto settling uh, in a in couple of our ponds we are also trying, but not for uh, bio not for biomass issue, but for uh, more like light issue. So I cannot go in much detail, but you give one flow with light, then it it goes to a groove where dark again it comes to the light. So yeah, so. So I would like to talk to you about this, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vandupadhyay. That was a very good um, industry perspective and a real eye opener. So uh, this concludes uh, today's uh, talks and sessions. Oh, uh, sorry. I would also uh, now request uh, Dr. Chitendra Thakur to please uh, present a moment to Professor Pandey Pandey. for being here and uh, making this uh, pretty, I think it's a very good session. I enjoyed it very much. Hope you enjoyed it too. And uh, this concludes the session for today. Uh, we will meet tomorrow 9.30, all the participants, uh, all the volunteers and the speakers. And as of now, uh, it's raining outside, so we have reponed the uh, dinner. Please join us at around 6.30 for the dinner. 6.45. And then you can walk around in the rain. It's a very good campus in the rain. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>